Good morning, everyone. It is 9 a.m. here in New York City. It's also Friday. This is Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Julie Hyman. Here are the three things that you need to know to start your morning. The $200 billion hit. Apple had a bad week facing the risk of a reported iPhone ban in China and one which could broaden. Any such action would be unprecedented and see the tech giant caught up in a fast escalating resurgence of the U.S.-China trade war. The world's second biggest economy, China, is a key market for Tim Cook's company, accounting for just under 19 percent of its overall revenue. And this week, data told the story, and it's one of diverging global growth, at least for now. The United States is staying resilient, it seems, with services and jobless data showing continued strength. It's a different story, though, in Europe and China. Data from the world's second largest economy showed exports dropping for a fourth straight month. Meanwhile, Germany's industrial production figures disappointed, further weighing on the region's stocks. And the G20 meet in New Delhi at a pivotal time with global economic growth, security and climate issues on the agenda. The big picture, it's an event notable for its absences. China's President Xi and Russia's Vladimir Putin are both no shows, opening the door to closer cooperation between the U.S. President Joe Biden and India's uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Ukraine is a big issue for leaders. India has indicated that the delegates are close to bridging a divide as the war with Russia rages on. Well, let's break down the top takeaways from this week. Brad and I have three of them. And we start with the uh, U.S. economy being resilient. Out of this week, showing the, the services sector in the U.S. gained strength in August. Jobless claims unexpectedly fell the prior week. That indicates a tighter than anticipated job market that is continuing here. Um, and what's interesting is, yes, we had, two, we had two reads on the services economy, right? The one from ISM did show surprising strength. The one from S&P, which is, uh, one could argue, a more comprehensive look, includes more sizes of companies, was not as strong. Nonetheless, broadly here, when you look at the economic data we've been getting over the past several months, it has indeed been surprising to the upside. Mm -hmm. And that's really been the story for much of the year as well. But we just kind of keep getting little reminders of it. Yeah. And, you know, as we think about the shift in spending that's taken place here from goods to services for so many consumers out there and thinking about this kind of consumer resiliency that we've heard about over the course of this earnings season from a myriad of different companies, how is that showing up? Well, one area that I would look at that's not necessarily the economic data, but is a piece of broader data that we can string together is how much people are spending on the experiences economy and traveling particularly here. And I was looking at some TSA passenger throughput numbers, really looking through the summer months here. So essentially from Memorial Day weekend all the way through Labor Day weekend, now that we have the data and can layer that year over year, we are running at 102% of pre-pandemic levels on the TSA tra uh, checkpoint travel numbers as of right now. So running that this morning, and so the travel spending continuing to remain strong at this point, um, but this resiliency is going to come with some tests, we should note too. The student loans uh, and that coming once again back on the table for repayment. That's going to be a test. October 1st there is when that recommences. And then additionally, you've seen excess savings start to be depleted a little bit more among households. So that shift in how households are spending, that's certainly of note here uh, in some of the tests for that consumer resiliency that we're going to be watching closely for. The it's also important, just quickly, how all of this is playing through in asset classes, right? Because yeah, we have yeah. this U.S. economic strength. That has meant a, a stronger dollar, which we've been talking a lot about out this week as well, and the implications for U.S. companies and for international economies and currencies. So the dollar strength part of the story. And uh, what also we've been seeing in terms of yields hmm. in the Treasury market is also obviously part of the story. What are the implications for the Federal Reserve and whether it's going to have to, if not keep raising rates, keep them higher for longer as the conversation keeps going. We've got 10-year yields that are um, you know, sort of hovering near their highest that they have been in more than a year. So that's something we continue to watch as well. Yeah, absolutely. And one other thing that we're watching here, the second big thing that Julie and I have our eye on or learned from this week, oil. Maybe the deflation spoiler. On Tuesday, Saudi Arabia and Russia agreed to extend their oil production cuts through the year's end. Both Brent and West Texas crude rose to their highest levels since November, fueling fears that elevated oil prices could stop 
moderating inflation here. And particularly, uh, we had a soundbite, or at least one of the comments on this from Mark Sandy, chief economist over at Moody's, who had said that $90 a barrel oil for any length of time would be problematic. Oil higher for longer in this instance, essentially, would be a problem for the Fed's fight against inflation. Yeah, and most of the oil um, analysts that we've spoken to have also said they don't expect it to, if it does fall, it's not going to fall by much. Mm -hmm. It seems to kind of be the consensus view here. We even have um, some estimates out from Goldman Sachs for it to be going significantly higher as well. Now, we know that the Fed doesn't specifically watch energy prices on their own because they do tend to be volatile. But the question is the feed through to other stuff. There are also implications for gasoline prices at the pump, which we're showing here now, um, and what that's going to mean politically, which is sort of a down-the-line story, but something that our Rick Newman has been talking about and has been watching very closely. Um, and then, sort of on a related note, when we talk about politics, we could talk about geopolitics. And the third takeaway from the week is the latest victim of the trade war and tensions between the U.S. and China taking a bite out of Apple. Shares of the tech giant falling this week on reports that China's iPhone ban is broadening across government, not just government agencies, but government-sponsored enterprises. China, one of the tech giant's biggest markets, it accounts for just under 19 percent of overall revenue. And Beijing has already limited government officials from using iPhones. Again, reportedly, this new report would significantly broaden that ban, sign signal a bigger crackdown. And for a company that has traditionally had more of a favorable relationship with the Chinese government. This perhaps signals a new front or a new mm. move in the tensions between the two countries, sort of ensnaring Apple within it, as we talked about, a big drop in those shares. But again, it raises these bigger questions about geopolitical maneuvering uh, on the part of different nations. And where companies have found themselves in the throes of that. I mean, when we think back to and kind of um, the chronological order that all of this has taken place within and ranging over administrations at this point, because China has a far further out view of how they want to play this. And I think for right now, the companies that have found themselves in the midst of this, sure, it's been TikTok and, and ByteDance. But then additionally, you've also found some of the chip companies finding themselves squarely within the throes of a tit for tat on intellectual property and where chips can be purchased or where they can be sold to. And now, even more so, it's coming into the consumer technology companies and Apple finding themselves in the throes of that this week and that coming to light, especially with the ban on government officials being able to use their devices. Now, the next question is, and investors would be, would be smart to think about, where else might this overflow into? Well, uh, there's an interesting call out this morning and, um, and particularly looking at other auto players with in China that could be maintaining or at least gaining some more favorability here. That could impact companies like Tesla. That could impact companies like Ford, who are all trying to release some of the most popular U.S. models that they've had on the mass market scale into China as well and produce there and have better favoritism there among consumers on price at least. Uh, and so in that battling for price, that's one area that investors would be smart or apt to just think about where else this could permeate out into as well. Also, we've got to talk about some other storm clouds. They are brewing as Apple faces challenges on several fronts here and reports that China's iPhone ban is broadening across government firms, putting pressure on the stock. Shares have plummeted over 6% over the past two days. It's the biggest back-to-back -back slide in 10 months. Staff at several Chinese agencies say that they were given instructions not to use Apple's iPhones or other foreign devices in the office. That was first reported by the Wall Street Journal. Meanwhile, the launch of Huawei's Mate 60 model Model, that could pose as a serious threat to Apple smartphone dominance. The device could potentially make a significant dent in Apple's sales. Let's bring in Santosh Rao, who is the Manhattan Venture Partners Head of Research to weigh in. Santosh, great to speak with you here this morning. Good morning. As, as we kind of just think about the impact that this will have near term for Apple, what type of, uh, of detriment or what type of dent could, could this mean for the, one of the largest U.S. technology companies. Yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, 
I think near term, it's more a headline risk. It's not going to be material. I mean, if it's enforced, uh, whatever they announced yesterday, uh, it's roughly 500,000 if every government employee and everyone you, uh, stops using it. So it's not much, uh, considering that about 40, 45 million uh, sales of iPhone. So it's a small uh, drop in the whole bucket there. But overall, I think it's the signaling that's happening. It's a shot across the bow, bow to all the uh, countries that want to restrict exports and limit all their activity. So I think uh, China is pretty much saying that, hey, there is a limit to how much you can do that. Already, they're seeing the supply chain being disrupted. They don't like that, right under their feet. Uh, and then overall, I think on a larger scale, you have to see that China itself is right now wobbling a little bit. The economy is. Unemployment is high. Exports are down. All the data coming out of there is still weak. And the Apple ecosystem employs roughly 5 million people. So I don't think they want to shake that tree too much, too hard. But the signaling is definitely there. Headline risk is there. But materially, in terms of dollars and cents, I don't see any impact near term. Down the road, OK, let's see where that happens. But at this point, I think uh, we will continue to see uh, the company operate as is. Uh, Santosh, your firm um, invests in a lot of startups. Um, are there implications just broadly for the tech sector for companies of any size and at any stage that want to do business in China? Um, should they think twice about entering that market? Should investors think twice about their exposure to that market? Absolutely. And I think companies are uh, doing that already. They are diversifying. They're going into India, Vietnam and other places if they need to. So I think that's 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 th that writing was on the wall for quite some time. They don't want to be the political football that they have become with these two countries fighting it out. So I think that's that's definitely a big risk. It's the last thing they want at a time when things are slowing down especially Apple, things are slowing down there and they have other issues to worry about. You know, why is the multiple so high when the revenues are coming down? So things like that, they need to work that out, that multiple compression going on. But this news kind of adds another soft layer on top of that saying, hey, there is this concern was always lingering, but looks like China is really trying to get more serious about it. But uh, they're not gonna go too far as of now, down the road, yes. And in terms of your question, yes, all tech companies, I think, have taken notice and they are diversifying away from China. Okay, and so where else are they going? And, and where should investors look for companies kind of placing those relationships outside of China to determine whether or not their global footprint that they're looking to establish is one that has staying power as well? Yeah, I was reading today that the iPhone 5s are going to be manufactured in India, quite a sizable uh, sizable percentage of them. So I think that's another case. Tesla is open factories there in India or planning to. So I think those are the things that you're going to see that slowly, it takes a while. I mean, Apple is so entrenched in China. It's not going to, they can't just uproot and start somewhere else. So it's going to take a while, a long while. So I think until then, they need to start moving and they are moving. The other countries are building the infrastructure, giving the tax incentives for these companies to come in and you're going to see a lot of that as the companies move out. India particularly stands out as a country that benefits from China's, uh, the bans on China. Sandosh, again, you know a lot about um, private companies and I am curious, you know, we talk, we've been talking about the flow from here to there, but I'm also curious about the flow from China to the U.S. How big a role had Chinese um, financing been playing in the private market in the U.S. and what kind of changes, if any, have we seen to that? Yeah, uh, it used to be very big uh, a while back, a few years back. I remember writing a report on how the Chinese VCs uh, are investing here, but it has slowed down quite a bit. And their own ecosystem is growing quite a bit. They are investing within their country. The next big startup, next big Facebook will, could very well come from there. So things like that. So they are big into their promoting their own VC system, EV, VC ecosystem. So the investments here have dropped. Uh, there is a negative element to this uh, here, what they do, they watch closely, who they hire, where they're investing and all that. So there are a lot of restrictions here. So I think they are more than comfortable just doing it there. So I think that's what's happening. You're seeing a lot of that where uh, they're building their own ecosystem. Santosh, thank you so much. Great to get your perspective this morning. Santosh Rao is Manhattan Venture Partners Head of Research. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Same to you. Well, looking at the global economy, inflation remains sticky, central banks are tightening, and consumers' confidence low. 
Joining us now, we've got Rebecca Walser, president of Walser Wealth Management. Rebecca, great to have you here in studio yes, with us. Great as well. to be here. Thank you, Brian, for having me. Absolutely. Bringing some of that Florida energy here for us. Uh, where are the biggest risks in the global economy, though, right now? Well, I think the biggest unknown right now is this announcement that we got out of Johannesburg, obviously, of Saudi Arabia and the UAE joining the BRICS bloc. And, um, you know, really focusing on that conference on a lot of bilateral trade and domestic currencies, which we know we saw in March the first amount of currency transactions actions in China for the first time in Chinese yuan outside of U.S. dollars. So that was already alarming. The number of U.S. dollar denominated bank reserves uh, retrenching is alarming. The M2 money supply coming down, alarming. All of these things are macroeconomically globally alarming. But I think that what was really interesting telling Brad was when they said that Saudi Arabia and UAE aren't joining until J January, it kind of gave them a, a time, a framework of time to be develop a framework with which the ultimate, which is really what I worry about, them announcing that they will start selling crude outside of U.S. dollar for the first time since 1974. That happens and we have, you know, potentially catastrophic dollar effects. Um, there doesn't seem to be an imminent sign that that is happening, to your point. And in the meantime, the U.S. E economic data, as we've been discussing, has been pretty resilient. If yes. you look at the city economic surprise index, yep. the rate at which our reports have been beating, and you compare that with the likes of the Eurozone, say, or the likes of China, although you can argue all day about Chinese economic data. But the point is, yeah. our data has been doing really well versus expectations. Yes. So how do you look at that data and, and sort of read the change in economic sentiment that we've seen in the U.S. Yeah. this year? Well, I think, Julie, you know, the United States is always the last. All of these impacts, we look at Asia and we look at Europe specifically because they're leading indicators for what will eventually come to America. And that's simply a product of the fact that we are the largest GDP. We do have the most, you know, we, we are it. We're obviously controlling the global reserve currency as well. So that obviously has given us a tremendous amount of benefits since 1944, Bretton Woods Agreement. So, you know, I think that I look at those things and America being so resilient kind of as a bifurcation of our economy. There's still a lot of haves, but there's also a very much a lot of have nots. And that's why people are so disjointed in hearing the good economic data and saying, but that's not me. I am still filling it in my pocket. You know, to your point earlier about the student loans resuming next month, that's five billion dollars a month of spending that can't go to service and can't go to goods. You know, we have Gen Zers that graduated in you know, 2019, 2020 that have worked for three and a half years and never, never even made a student loan payment. Have they budgeted for that? Did they plan on it because they expected this administration to potentially forgive some of that student loan debt? So maybe they didn't budget it or expect it to be less. So there's a lot of things that we can take away with the U.S. being resilient, but eventually, Julia, all things will eventually get to us and we will have to uh, have that reckoning here as well. So with all of these factors on the table, what are your clients asking you right now? Where are you kind of positioning portfolios? I think people are confused, right? Because they're seeing bad data, good data, bad data, good data. They're seeing Powell saying we have to raise, 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 hawkish comments in Jackson Hole, but yet weakening and softening labor. And we're starting to see those things. But then also this week coming back and unemployment claims going down. So, you know, there's such bifurcated data that people get confused. I think the thing to understand is there is an economic situation that has to come. We have to deal with the fact that we printed so much money and it has implicated inflation, obviously. But Powell has done the best he can. He's been able to really be aggressive because he's had labor as a stalwart. When we start to see labor softening, that's when we start to think that Powell has got to change his tune. So people are just wanting to, if it's not going to be a soft landing, is it going to be a soft landing? Can we just get through and can we get back to some level of normalcy? I think people are just, we're just all tired of it being so chaotic, right? And it has been, I think, since 2022, really. 2020, probably. Yeah, longer than that, I would put it. Um, <laughs> Global so, financial crisis in yeah, 2008. Well, yeah, we want to go back that far. Um, so what then do you do as an investor if, if that is the sort of framework here? I think you are going to look at your individual perspective. If we've got a long runway, I would absolutely look at this as a potential buying opportunity. Maybe I think maybe a little bit of a pullback is coming and that's when I would really uh, buy. And if I'm a long investor, if I'm a shorter term investor, if I'm already in retirement, if I'm 10 years from retirement, I absolutely am going to be a little bit more um, conservative on risk on assets and potentially uh, more safety. And certainly there's a lot of places is right now that we can get yield without taking a lot of risk because obviously you know, yields are so high. And so internationally, you know, even as we think about where else investors might be looking for a bull market to emerge yeah. after some of either the lackluster data that's come out or even the, the tightening of or deglobalization um, more broadly that we've been tracking over the past several years mm -hmm. here. 
where would an investor be apt to look in certain or specific sectors yeah. even at this time? Well, obviously AI and tech is the new generational. I would say that that would be similar to the, the launch of the internet, the dot-com bubble and social media all coming about from 2000 and on. I would say AI is clearly the new, the next gen. I mean, it is the robotization and the the AI in of, you know, the chat GPT, you know, there's a lot of things that are coming from the AI space. A lot of people think it's just robotics and they just think of, oh, it's going to replace the burger flippers. At the, at the fast food joints, that's not the case at all. It's super highly intelligent. You're talking about neurobotic brains, neurosurgeries, all kinds of things. But as far as you know, um, what they can do right now and, and where's the global opportunity, you know, Brad, I think of Foxconn and Global and what Modi's trying to do over there, and they just pulled out of that 19 and a half billion joint venture for their chip maker in India. But I think India has done so much. They have preliminary agreements with almost 30 countries to start bilaterally trading in the rupee. They're trying to become a global uh, mover and shaker. And with 1.3 billion people, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity that will be moving to India away from China to divest and to give us more supply chain diversification. You know, it's interesting because U.S. investors have been so focused on China over the past decade at least, right? Now as they turn to India, what is the way that you would advise clients to get in there? Is it through an ETF that tracks the overall market? Like what, you know, as we try to explore those opportunities, yeah. what is the way to do it? And that is exactly the problem. And I think this is what's going to actually be the, the new frontier of, of in ingenuity, right? Because we have blockchain capabilities where we can track and we can see we don't have to trust anymore. You know, a lot of people are afraid, well, we can't trust what they're doing. We don't know what the data, like specific, specifically China I'm talking about, we don't know if the data is real. It's the government, CCP, and all these things. But, you know, you start leveraging the blockchain, we can have verified everything. So I think that the new frontier is going to be stuff on the blockchain that can be verified without trust, and it's going to be AI and robotic related and, and that's the new frontier um, and, and I'm looking for the even more uh, seamless globalization through blockchain. Hmm. All right. I love the blockchain. It's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> Rebecca Walser, president of Walser Wealth Management. Thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank you guys. All right. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance on the blockchain. Any back to school tips <laughs> or things that you try to utilize? Well, first of all, I don't know. If, I don't know if you have kids. If I you, have two boys. Two okay. boys. They started this week. All right. And so, like, how do you get ready? I try to make sure they have their supplies. They have their agendas. We already lost a water bottle, so uh, I am ready. I know. I'm getting a solid like <laughs> C plus on back to school. <laughs> yeah, I try to stress not too much about the whole thing.
Shares of Kroger are slipping today after the grocer saw sales come in below expectations in the second quarter after it said it incurred a $1.4 billion opioid claim settlement. But also big news coming on its quest to acquire Albertsons. Remember, they have been trying to win antitrust approval for their merger of $24.6 billion. What had been reported upon earlier in the week has indeed been confirmed um, that the company is going to sell 413 stores, or I should say Kroger and Albertsons together, collectively, yeah. are going to sell 413 stores to the privately held CNS Wholesale Grocers, which I believe owns the Piggly Wiggly stores. Really? Among others. I have a Piggly Wiggly tank top. I pull it out for the summers. Got it from Hilton Head Island, I really South need a picture of this. Done deal. In any, in any case, yes. so that's what's going on here this morning. So, yes, Kroger did report the numbers, but it's sort of been overshadowed by this divestiture because mm. they have been trying to get this merger done. So, for the numbers then, I will yes. add that in, layer that in. Uh, identical sales without fuel. That increased by about 1%. Underlying growth of about 2.6% all in. Um, this is also a quarter where they saw digital sales grow by about 12%. Of course, uh, there was many years ago, I believe around 2018, that deal that they made with Ocado to really kind of beef up their ability to have more of these digital connections. So continuing to see digital sales grow at a time where, of course, Walmart, Amazon continuing to invest into that front for themselves on the grocery business. And on even as Walmart has a large line share of the grocery market share here in the U.S., once you look at the digital market share for grocery, that's where Amazon and, and Walmart get a little bit closer here. And for Kroger, trying to continue to maintain uh, the number of households that they service, that's where they actually might have a little bit more of a competitive point or journey as well here. Yeah, and it's interesting as we get back to the consolidation for just a second here. Yeah. Um, you know, the U.S. grocery market is still incredibly diverse, right? Yeah. You don't have a lot of consolidation. That CNS company, by the way, isn't even the largest held private grocer. There are quite a number um, in the United States. Wegmans, one of them, is opening downstairs Thank in goodness. our building. Um, and uh, and then you have the likes of Publix, et cetera, as well um, in, in the United States. So um, this Kroger-Albertsons combination will indeed create a big player in the industry, but there still are a lot of big players. But as we know, the Federal Trade Commission has been we could say more reluctant to approve some big deals across a host of industries. You know, it sort of has a wrap of being um, anti-tech, if you will, or reluctant to allow tech deals. And in fact, maybe trying to separate tech companies, um, but it's not just tech. They are really scrutinizing deals in other industries like grocery as well. Yeah, and included within the sale too, I mean, you mentioned the 413 stores. you got eight distribution centers, two offices, five private label brands. And, and here's why I mentioned those private label brands across the 17 states and District of Columbia is because in a trade down environment, those private label brands become even more valuable mm -hmm. for a company to be able to deploy to so many customers who are just looking across price or their unit price that they are actually paying and, and actually trying to figure out, all right, can we save a few nickels, dimes, dollars um, and cents in, a, in a certain areas of that grocery store or shopping experience as well. And so uh, that private label part of this could be particularly valuable in this deal too. Yeah. And they have the benefit of being higher margin yeah. as well. So that's kind of something that, that helps out the, uh, the stores as well. So we'll see if indeed they get approval for this deal. They say they're still planning to close it in early 20. 24. So um, as we look at that, we also have to look at the bigger picture here and taking a look at futures here this morning as we prepare for the opening bell in less than a minute. We don't have much change in the futures. Very slight upward bias for the down the S&P, slight negative bias for the Nasdaq. As we know, the Nasdaq has been the underperformer over the past couple of days and on this back to school week for at least here, this northeast area. Um, and so we have been watching crude oil prices that have been moving up. We have been watching yields that have been kind of in a range this week. And the dollar, which has been broadly strengthening, although a little more sideways over the past couple of days. Yeah, I've been keeping a close eye on some of those back to school stocks over the course of this oh, week, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been interesting. Foot Locker, uh, they're down pre market. We won't ramble on about them because we got the opening bell of Wall Street, but we'll see how they open up this morning. Yes, we will. We'll, maybe we'll check on that in the interactive for just a moment. Um, I made a Foot Locker purchase oh, yeah? this week, not for myself, 
but for a back to schooler. Um, let's do a quick check in the markets here as we open up, sponsored by Tasty Trade. And indeed, we have this little changed open that we were looking for here. Investors have really been uh, continuing to look ahead, right? We did get some economic data this week. CPI next week is going to be the main event here. So, given all of that, the Dow right now opening up just about five and a half points, uh, although now a little more, but still less than a tenth of a percent move. Ditto for the S&P 500, the Nasdaq as well. So all three major averages just kind of hovering here this morning, Brad. Under the surface, I hope there's some more movement. Show us what's going on. Oh, well, I'll take it out to the past five days. We'll kind of just enlarge the surface. How about that? <laughs> past five days, we're down by about six tenths of a percent for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Flat, but to the upside, as Julie mentioned, to start off today's activity, uh, barely higher for the Nasdaq composite. That's up by about one tenth of a percent. But the five days tell the story and really a five day period where all eyes have been on the movements out of China and government officials perhaps not being able to use Apple phones. Uh, and we'll see what for, what more comes forward on that. But as of right now, over the past five days, down by about 1.9 percent for the Nasdaq composite. And you could see where some of that move really initiated midweek uh, on this holiday abbreviated traded week as well, we should add here. And the S&P 500, you're seeing that down by about 1.1 uh, percent over the past five days for the S&P. Uh, higher, though, this morning by about one tenth of a percent. Also want to take a look at some of the sector activity out of the gate here. And here's where it'll get a little bit more interesting for us here. 11 sectors. We've got them loaded up here for you on the screen. There we go. All right. Staples right now down by one tenth of a percent. We've got more gainers than laggards. Energy that is fueling the charge higher here, at least among the kind of aggregate as we're up by about two tenths of a percent. Uh, energy up by about three quarters of a percent. You're also seeing some of those communication services stocks having a little bit of a time at the open. It's up by about three tenths of a percent. Technology also interestingly higher by about a quarter of a percent. And then lastly, Here's a look at the Nasdaq Composite as we ride out, and I'll toss things back on over to Julie at the desk. And we will talk about some more of the movers that we are watching here, Brad. DocuSign's on the list. The shares now up less than 1%, but they were climbing quite a bit more in uh, pre-market trading. And after the bell yesterday, the company raised its full-year guidance despite battling macro headwinds. The company's CFO said DocuSign remains focused on what we can control. You see there a little bit of an increase in the forecast. And it looks like a lot of the um, analysts are pointing to billings as well as something positive from the company, uh, that billings forecast in particular. Tyler Radke over at City saying results were much better than feared with that strong beat on billings. He also said the company's not out of the woods yet. It does still needs to accelerate growth, but the things are getting a little bit better here. And I think we have now lapped one year since Dan Springer left the company as a CEO, right. um, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. So new leadership really trying to press things forward. Yeah, that new CEO, Alan Thigeson, CEO of DocuSign, uh, saying that we increased our pace of innovation by delivering new key features while strengthening our uh, self-service and partner distribution channels, also receiving tremendous enthusiasm, product roadmap, particularly from enterprise customers. Uh, you mentioned Billings. Billings, $711 million in this most recent quarter. That was an increase of 10% year over year. Also, uh, speaking of the revenue here, you saw a, a net increase of about 11% year over year. Subscription revenue, that's what you should pay attention to as well here. That is much more of the kind of contracted or annualized figure that um, a lot of investors can keep an eye on over an extended period of time. That was up 11% year over year. Yeah, all of this at the backdrop, I just wanted to mention, the stock is still down 6% um, this year. Um, and I believe it fell last year quite a bit as well, if I remember. Yep, it was down 64% last year and 31% the year over that. Remember, it saw the pandemic bump and then just could not keep that momentum going. All right. Well, from signatures to comfy sofas or couches. or <laughs> Do they sell sofas? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Restoration hardware. Yeah, shares are slipping today. Very nice mirrors there, too, I will say. After the company's CEO warned that the current economic backdrop would remain challenging for those mirror sales throughout fiscal 2023 as mortgage rates remain at 20-year highs. What's the correlation? Of course, if people aren't moving into new homes, maybe they don't need a new mirror. Or they can just build it into the one that they're already got under construction. Anyway, restoration hardware, some of the details here, particularly as you kind of think through the environment that they've had to navigate. Um, 
where, of course, they're looking at what the pace of home sales may look like, but also in the home furnishings environment that is, of course, a discretionary purchase that has been challenged over the last year, and that is going to be a continued headwind or a macro headwind or factor uh, that the company has to acknowledge in this environment, too. Yeah, I mean, and this is partly an expectations game when it comes to this stock because the shares are up 38%. Most of the analyst commentary I've seen has not been that negative. Mm. It's just a matter of can they meet what is being priced in in that kind of share performance. The company's third quarter forecast um, is as much as $760 million. So it's a little bit short of estimates. It's not hugely short of estimates, but when you've got a stock that has climbed as much as it has, even if it is not that short of estimates, you see uh, a punishment like we are seeing today for the shares. Yeah, and, and keep a close eye on margins too with mm -hmm. this company. Uh, margins, 47.5%, at least their gap gross margins, um, their, their adjusted gross margin, 47.5% as well, uh, versus 52.8% last year. And so if there is even some moderating in that margin base, especially given the fact that this is this is, this is not cheap um, uh, goods that they're selling into people's homes. I mean, I, I remember walking into one, and you always walk in one, it's kind of like dark and brooding, but a very sophisticated dark and brooding that it has. And so uh, you, you come to expect a very high value, um, high cost as well type of purchase that many of their customers are making. Um, and we'll, we'll see exactly how they sustain some of these margins. over the You say they have nice mirrors. Have you ever actually purchased the mirror, or have you just window shot last time I, I, I no I just I just look at the mirror I you know check out my attire I make sure I'm good to walk back outside that's kind of I rest like that's the point I'm trying in to this make. heat you just get some air conditioning and you go back <laughs> out all your markets action straight ahead stay tuned you're watching Yahoo Finance it's not enough to know what's happening now you need to know what's happening next. I'm Dan Howley, and this is what's next with Samsung. So you can put it in the water. That's dust pretty gnarly. Water. This is the heart and soul of Astrobotic. This is where we build our landers up to go to the surface of the moon. Is the future high power, bigger boats? How easy is it to take the battery out, do the charging thing? Imagine being able to charge without ever plugging in. It's becoming a reality thanks to technology that's hidden beneath my feet. We'll show you what tomorrow will look like today. Join us for our new series next.
Mobile phones, once simply tools for making calls, are now versatile devices that put all of the power of a computer in your pocket. They've changed a lot in the last decade, and Yahoo Finance's Dan Halley is here to break down the evolution of the smartphone. Hey, Dan. That's right, Brad. Uh, you know, we're talking about uh, a, uh, obviously we have Apple coming up uh, with their newest phone. We're talking about uh, kind of the growth and jump that we've seen over the past decade plus in smartphones. And so uh, I just kind of want to break down some of the biggest changes that we've seen over the years. And obviously, we cannot talk about smartphones without talking about Apple. Mm -hmm. The very first uh, iPhone, this came out in 2007. Uh, it didn't even have 3G when it came out. I don't know if you guys remember the Edge Network on AT&T. Uh, I vividly remember being at a, uh, like going pumpkin picking with my friends, waiting online for a haunted house that was awful. Uh, and my <laughs> friend being like, you can load the internet on here. And he's standing in a field and waiting and waiting and waiting. And I was like, this seems dumb. Why, why? this doesn't load, go, go, go to your computer. Uh, obviously uh, that proved wrong uh, as I have an iPhone in my uh, lap. But uh, after the iPhone you know, blew up out of the app store, uh, then the other major uh, announcement that we had seen was the first Android phone. Now, uh, interestingly enough, Google was going to roll out an Android phone prior to the T-Mobile G1, which was going to land before the iPhone. Uh, and then uh, the head of Android at, uh, then at Google, Andy Rubin, uh, the story goes, is that he was in a cab. Uh, he saw uh, video or heard video uh, playing of the iPhone launch, pulled over and said, we have to stop everything we're doing. We have to reinvent what we've been putting out or, or into this Android device and go and do what Apple was doing. Mm. Uh, and so it was kind of a slider device you saw there uh, as a G1. And now Android, the largest uh, mobile operating system in the world, uh, and uh, their biggest company behind Android, Samsung, is neck and neck with Apple for the lead in smartphones globally. And then finally, speaking of Samsung, uh, we used to have tiny phones, and now we have gigantic phones. <laughs> and the reason for that is uh, Samsung's original Galaxy Note. This thing, when it came out, uh, I remember this coming out. By the way, the G1, I remember a friend brought it over to my house, and I was just like, what, what is going on here? This is pretty cool. You can you know, do everything you can do with this iPhone thing, but a keyboard, whoa! Uh, and those were all gone, obviously, because they didn't make sense. But the, the original Note, uh, I was working at uh, an old publication, Laptop uh, Magazine, and the Note came in uh, for us to review. And I just you know, was like, this is, who's gonna put this in their pocket? Right. And it had a five and a half inch screen, and now we have you know, 6.7 inch screens and everything along those lines. And now, I mean, you know, you take those three phones and you can just see how we've evolved over the past decade, you know, or so. Uh, and, you know, this went from a market where people were only talking about BBM, BlackBerry Messenger. Yeah, if you it. didn't have a BlackBerry, yeah. you know, I remember going to BlackBerry's conference uh, in uh, Orlando uh, and, you know, they aren't here anymore and these guys are. And you know, moving forward, we don't know where we're going to go at this point. Um, but to say that those three phones haven't tr or have truly pushed us to where we are in technology, think about it. You wouldn't have Uber. Uh, you wouldn't be able to Zillow, uh, you know, shop for dream homes. I'm looking at a two million dollar mansion uh, mm -hmm. in New Jersey right now. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to buy it. I just want to see what it would be like. Just looking at it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I had a cool bar in the basement. You can be Aaron Rodgers' uh, neighbor, right? Oh, yeah. Me and, me and Aaron. We'll, uh, we'll hang out. We'll yeah. uh, go on his retreats and stuff. It'll be great. So as we talk about the next uh, sort of evolution, where our phone's going from here, um, linked to that, Dan, of course, we're excited to announce that we're launching Next, which is our new weekly original series. It's going to give you a glimpse at what the companies we cover every day are planning for the future. And to that end, you, Dan, went all the way to South Korea. You mentioned Samsung to look at what Samsung is now working on, which sort of combines the tiny phones you mentioned with the giant phones. In other words, a foldable phone. That's right, yeah. So I went down to South Korea. Uh, I was invited to the headquarters of Samsung to go hands-on with their latest foldable smartphones. That's right, we've gone from the flat rectangle to foldables and get a chance to see how these products of made uh, are made. And while, 
you know, we live in and around the New York area uh, and in the U.S. Uh, Apple is the dominant smartphone. If you have a green message in your uh, text message chat, you're probably ostracized <laughs> by your friend. <laughs> Samsung is actually the global leader by a hair. Uh, it's essentially neck and neck, and they're going all in now on foldable smartphones. Uh, I got to examine whether or not this could help Samsung overtake Apple here in the U.S., and here's a quick preview of that trip. I've been on the train for five minutes, and I've already spotted five people with foldable phones, whether they're the Z Fold or the Z Flip. People are using them here a lot. <laughs> So yeah, that's just a, a quick sneak peek. And yeah, you know, I mean, foldable phones are still relatively new. But, you know, when I was wandering around Seoul, people had them everywhere. Uh, you know, my wife and I would just walk around pointing out, oh, there's a Galaxy Z Fold, there's a Galaxy uh, Z Flip. And I mean, to, to be honest, I got to use both phones. I, I uh, reviewed them. The Flip is awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would buy one if I didn't spend a thousand bucks on a, a new iPhone last year and, you know, another couple of hundred on an Apple Watch. So all total, it was more than I wanted to spend. So I'm probably going to keep a hold of those for a little bit. But the Flip is really awesome. And what they're, what they're doing uh, with the front screen and the, the opening uh, to be able to you know shrink it down so it's not right. taking up so much space is really really interesting well we're going to talk much more about it so people should definitely stay tuned here yahoo finances new video series next is going to debut today at 10 a.m eastern you're going to see more in depth of what dan experienced and we're going to talk about the apple versus samsung battle here so please stay tuned for that in the meantime Regulation around crypto has been making headlines lately, with SEC filing lawsuits against the several big names in the space, from Ripple Labs to FTX, of course, and it's having significant impacts on crypto investments. It might be why some crypto exchanges have started for searching for more regulatory clarity around the globe. At least that's what Coinbase chairman and CEO Brian Armstrong told our executive editor Brian Sazi at the Goldman Sachs Communicopia and Tech Conference. Well, we're not going, going anywhere out of the U.S. The U.S. is our biggest market, but we do look at everywhere around the world and we look for regulatory clarity and that helps us prioritize our investments. So, you know, a really interesting stat, 83% of the G20 countries now either ha already have crypto legislation or it's in progress. And that's, that's, that's attractive for us. That's where we're going to go invest. The U.S. is a little bit of a laggard here, but I'm sure the U.S. is going to get there too. We were seeing Congress have a couple bills go through the, the House. Uh, we're seeing the courts come out with favorable rulings. Um, we're going to we're going to get there eventually in the U.S. too. So, yeah, Coinbase is going to be a U.S. company with a multinational reach. What countries are you focused on overseas? Well, we just launched in Canada last month. That was great. We did a pre-registration statement with the regulator in Canada. It's been really great to work with. We launched a payment rail integration interact in Canada. Uh, we also launched in May our, our international derivatives exchange, which is important. Derivatives trading is a big piece of the crypto ecosystem. We need to make sure we're playing there. So we launched that. Um, so we're going to keep going country by country in major markets. Uh, we're also going to make sure that the U.S. is, is taken care of. We just got um, approved with our FCM license in the U.S. for derivatives trading. So those will be big. Why are these other countries more open to what you do than the United States? That is a good question. Um, you know, the political environment is tough sometimes in the U.S. People each have their own interests. But the good news is that there's rule of law in the U.S., and, um, you know, that has to be followed. So the courts are making sure that that's being enforced. When I go meet with members of Congress, I think there's broad recognition that this technology is important. It's not going anywhere. Um, and it needs to be done in a tr safe and trusted way for American consumers to make sure this doesn't go offshore. There's, there's important national security implications of that, too, for the U.S. I mean, look what happened with 5G and semiconductors. This stuff moved offshore and now we're trying to fight like hell to get it back onshore. Um, and so in the U.S., we need to make sure we've got the, get the legislation in place that other places like Europe have already done. As a, as a founder or co-founder, you just get frustrated having to deal with all this. Don't you just want to be able to get your technology out there and, and help people and bring your vision to life? Well, one important part of being a founder is to never give up. And there's always some new challenge that's being presented in front of you. Um, sometimes those are technology challenges and those are important. I'd, you know, and frankly, I'd rather we, we were just focusing on the product and the technology. But if it comes in the form of we don't have regulatory clarity or there's hostility, you know, anytime you enter a new market, um, there's going to be entrenched incumbents that they have some resistance to that. That's the history of all technology, whether it was the Internet, you know, the electric car. Like you go, go back the, when the bicycle was introduced into uh, into American society, people were skeptical of it. And it's because 
it changes the, the way society works. And um, it brings about a lot of improvements, but it's a shift. And, and the old guard sometimes doesn't like that, those kinds of shifts in society. We've gotten this question before from investors. Now that we finally were able to talk to you, let me ask you this. I mean, do you think the, the SEC just doesn't want you to succeed? You know, I, I don't want to comment too much personally. I, and the SEC, by the way, is made up of many different people. We we have really good relationships, I think, with um, the staff that are at the SEC, um, many of the commissioners. I do think the leadership there has taken a very hostile view towards crypto uh, regulation by enforcement posture instead of just engaging in, in rulemaking as they're required to by law under um, the Administrative Procedures Act. And so, um, you know, that's the courts have now pushed back, which is good. But I think somehow this is going to be resolved, whether it's the CFTC stepping up, Congress creating new legislation, the courts creating that clarity, or maybe next year we'll have a different SEC chair. Somehow this is going to get resolved in the U.S. And it's it's like that old Winston Churchill quote, right? It's that the U.S. Um, always does the right thing, but only after exhausting every other option. Do you, to realize your ultimate vision for this company, does someone else besides Gary Gensler need to be in that seat? Um, I don't think so. I mean... That would certainly help, but in this environment right now in the U.S. for us, it's kind of business as usual. You know, we're continuing to operate. Um, there's more developers entering the crypto ecosystem uh, every year, even even if the prices are down. And you know, frankly, if you look at the last 11 years of Coinbase's history, we've gone through four cycles now like this, where the prices go up, the prices come down, but every time it's at a it's at a new uh, plateau, right? I mean, if you look at trough to trough, um, we're way up over 20, 2019. You know, it's. It's hard for us, to, if you zoom out, it's kind of hard for us to feel like we're really in a crypto winter. I mean, Bitcoin's still over 20,000. Um, and, you know, we're, we take a long-term perspective on these things. So we're unfazed, we're unflappable, we're, gonna, we're not going anywhere, we're going to keep building, and this technology is going to benefit, you know, hopefully a billion or more people around the world someday. What's your take uh, on, on the spot Bitcoin ETF? Is that something that will ignite the next move higher in crypto and, and the crypto winter? Yeah, it's been great to see so many ETF applications being filed, especially by these blue chip firms, you know, Fidelity, BlackRock, um, the biggest names in traditional financial services. So, uh, and by the way, Coinbase has been named as the custodian on, on all but one of these ETF applications that's been filed. So we have an important role to play here in the ecosystem. But, um, you know, it shows that uh, new pools of capital could come in when these ETFs get approved. That's exciting. I, I personally think it's very additive. You know, sometimes people think, oh, is that, isn't that going to be competitive with Coinbase? We want crypto to be integrated into all aspects of the financial services industry. You know, every bank, every ETF, every payment channel. We just saw this week uh, Visa said they're going to be having USD coin move over their rails. Um, we want it to be integrated into all aspects of the financial services, services industry. That was our executive editor, Brian Sazi, speaking with the Coinbase CEO, Brian Armstrong. Well, we've got all your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. It's not enough to know what's happening now. You need to know what's happening next. I'm Dan Howley, and this is What's Next with Samsung. So you can put it in the water. That's pretty gnarly. Water. This is the heart and soul of Astrobotic. This is where we build our landers up to go to the surface of the moon. Is the future high power, bigger boats? How easy is it to take the battery out, do the charging thing? Imagine being able to charge without ever plugging in. It's becoming a reality thanks to technology that's hidden beneath my feet. We'll show you what tomorrow will look like today. Join us for our new series next.
Coming up, you know Yahoo Finance will travel far and wide to bring you the story. So we sent our most intrepid reporter to one of the world's most innovative cities, a man who needs no introduction. Okay, Stan Howley. Find out what he's up to on Yahoo Finance's Next. Well, what is next in tech? Our very own Dan Halley took a trip to South Korea to find out just that, where he got an inside look into Samsung's latest smartphone developments and what this means for its ongoing battle with Apple. Stay tuned for the premiere of our new series, Next. It's on the other side of this break. Seoul, South Korea is a city of many colors, many styles, and many flavors. And seemingly everywhere you turn in Seoul, you'll see Samsung, a company that does, well, many things. It makes semiconductors and TVs, cargo ships and refrigerators. They even sell insurance. But they're best known for producing one of the most dominant lines of smartphones in the world, right up there next to Apple. Yes, Samsung does many things. But one thing Samsung does not do often is invite tech journalists to the very factories where these futuristic phones are made. Until now, I'm Dan Howley, and this is What's Next with Samsung. Okay, it's 3.30 a.m. New York time. We're going to Seoul, South Korea to go hands-on with Samsung's new Galaxy Z Flip 5 and Galaxy Z Fold 5. But maybe even more exciting is the fact that we're also going to Samsung's factory where they build their latest foldable phones. That's pretty cool. There's more to the story. First, I need a coffee though. Okay, so here's the broader picture. The smartphone in your pocket hasn't changed for years. Sure, its camera and processor take better photos and are more powerful, but overall, it's still the same black rectangle that you've always had. And that's what Samsung is trying to change with its newest foldable phones, but changing people's habits can be difficult. 
especially when it comes to their most important gadget. Yeah, the biggest difficulty is a multi-trillion dollar company called Apple. <laughs> it comes down to one application, iMessage. When Americans got hooked on iMessage, we just couldn't get off. But yeah, it's, it's iMessage. But there's reason to believe Samsung could be the company to inspire a larger move towards foldables, even if that ultimately means inspiring Apple to follow suit. But I do think Apple is closely watching Samsung. I think they're closely watching foldable displays. And they're also waiting, quite honestly, till there's a manufacturer who can produce enough of them for Apple. For years, Samsung has stayed ahead of the curve, outfitting their phones with wireless charging, massive displays, well before Apple was doing any of that. And that history of innovation continues with the Z Flip and Z Fold lines, which are now, and this is important, in their fifth generation. That kind of commitment by Samsung is worth noting, especially when you consider their global market share and influence. A 15-hour flight is a good chance to talk through some numbers. According to CounterPoint Research, global smartphone revenue hit $409 billion in 2022, down from $450 billion in 2021. In Q1 2023, Samsung controlled 22% of the market, a virtual tie with Apple's 21%. In the US, Apple dominates with 57% of the market. Samsung, according to StatCounter, has just 27%. But in South Korea, it's a different story. Here in South Korea, Samsung controls 63% of the smartphone market. Apple, just 31%. And it's pretty clear the moment you step off your plane, pretty much everyone's using a Samsung smartphone, kind of like a Samsung Precedent. Yeah, so we're uh, touring Samsung's facilities uh, during the rainy season in South Korea. It also happens to be incredibly humid. I am acclimated to New York, so uh, I'm basically just wet all the time. I'm a big old sweaty baby. We're gonna take a bus now over to Samsung's digital city. It's basically a massive campus. I mean, calling it a city is the right thing. Let's go. I've been to Google's campus. Huge, Apple's campus, huge. This is right up there with both of those. So I'm here at the tour of uh, Samsung's facilities. We're gonna go get a deeper look at some of their R&D stuff. And you can see these huge buildings behind me. These are all Samsung buildings. Uh, this is just part of the, the complex here. It's, it's a big kind of to-do that we're getting this access to the facilities. We won't be able to film the more sensitive areas, but still we'll be able to get a look and then I'll be able to write about it, so stay tuned. We just got out of Samsung's uh, quality assurance lab, basically showing how they test all of their devices. Uh, we saw different types of machines that they kind of run the actual foldables through, as well as their watches. Different types of drop tests, tumbler tests, different types of ways they drop it on different surfaces. Heat, humidity, cold, uh, water submersion, uh, anechoic chambers, I got to go in one, which is always fun. Uh, and really, you know, this is a part of Samsung's broader push to show that these are kind of the future for their smartphone line. Hey, we're heading down on the subway. We're gonna go check out Gangnam, where I also happen to be staying because I'm bougie like that. Which way? We gotta get that. It's like 100,000% humidity, I think. I've been on this train for five minutes and I've already spotted five people with foldable phones, whether they're the Z Fold or the Z Flip. People are using them here a lot. <laughs> uh, we're gonna go check out the new Z Fold 5 and Z Flip 5, get some uh, hands-on with those bad boys and see what they're all about. So this is what we're here for. This is the Galaxy Z Flip 5, and this is the Galaxy Z Fold 5. They're slick, fancy, have new hinges, but they're also pretty pricey. Starting at $9.99 for the Flip and $17.99 for the Fold, they're also competing with Google's new Pixel Fold and Motorola's Razr Plus, as well as a handful of Chinese foldables. As of now, Apple has yet to join the party. But as you might expect, manufacturing something like this is a bit more complicated than your standard candy bar style smartphone. 
So to see exactly how they're built, I got up at 5 a.m. to take a three-hour bus ride from Seoul to Samsung's factory in Gumi. We're here on Samsung's Gumi campus. Basically, this is where they manufacture uh, some of the biggest products that they sell, especially their smartphone line. Uh, you can hear the cicadas kind of going crazy in the background. Uh, but this is where they really do put together the, the smartphones that end up in people's hands. So let me sketch out what I saw inside for you. Inside Samsung's Gumi factory, the company pumps out everything from earbuds to tablets to smartphones. On one floor, custom-made robotic arms grab strips of printed circuit boards that are then filled with electronics components as small as two millimeters and pass through an oven to solder everything into place. On a separate floor, an assembly line of yellow Samsung-branded arms put together the company's Galaxy S23, while another line builds the Galaxy Z Fold 5. But what I mostly saw inside the factory was Samsung's massive commitment to foldable phones as its future. And that dedication was even more apparent during the company's unpacked event. Samsung's foldable strategy provides the company with two things, a unique way to get consumers genuinely interested in smartphones again, and more importantly, a means to combat arch rival Apple. With its lineup of foldable phones, the company has something Apple doesn't, a new exciting form factor that gets people talking. Nearly everyone I showed a flip or fold to was immediately impressed with the phone's design and styling. And the company isn't stopping there. Samsung executives hinted at further building out their foldable phones in the future. Unfortunately, as you might expect, they didn't offer any concrete plans. After spending a week with Samsung, checking out its facilities and speaking to some of its representatives, it's clear the company sees foldables as its future. But does that mean that a foldable is in your future? Will you give up that stale black rectangle for something that bends? It's too difficult to tell. While Samsung and its Chinese competitors have embraced the form factor, Motorola now has its Razer Plus, and Google has the Pixel Fold. The one company that has yet to go for a foldable is Apple. In 2021, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman said the company was exploring the kind of technology to make a foldable iPhone. More recently, though, he said they're focusing on an iPad. If, however, Apple does come out with a foldable iPhone and Samsung is still rocking it, then foldables may be the future. And that square rectangle in your pocket just might not be that long for this world. Dan Halley, happily for him, um, is now in a nice, overly air-conditioned studio yeah, back from South <laughs> Korea. Um, he, uh, obviously, you're back. You've got a lot of insight into Samsung, a company that we don't hear directly from mm. about a, a lot, especially here in the United States and especially compared to Apple. So give us some of your key takeaways here about this phone and about what you saw. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the big thing that I saw probably in, in Seoul uh, is how prevalent Samsung obviously is, and that being it's Samsung's home country, right? And so it's the same thing here in the U.S. Uh, with Apple. But the, the major thing was just how many foldable phones were around, right? That was something that uh, I, I noticed the minute we landed um, in, in South Korea. And we were looking for those, uh, but they the, the literally, I mean, I was on the train, I saw people just, you know, hanging out with them. Um, trying just, to take just, just so just quickly, Dan. If uh, there are already a lot of foldables there, what is different? You, yeah, you went there to see this new foldable, yeah. right? So if all these foldables are already out there, they sell a lot of them. What's different about this new one? So the when Samsung first launched its first foldables, there were technical problems with them, right? There was an issue where uh, there's a cover, sort of a, a film on the screen because it's a, it's a this, I mean it literally folds in, in half, right? Uh, and especially with these, they fold f flush. Um, so they had to pull them back at first because of problems with the, the build of them. Uh, and then since then, they've kind of been perfecting them. The first ones had a little tiny display on the front because it was like, OK, well, you know, I'm going to flip this phone open. I'm going to close it. And then what? I don't have access to a screen. Uh, and now really what we're seeing is kind of the perfection of these. And that's what Samsung is doing here. And it's also the point where they're saying, OK, we have our dominant Galaxy uh, S line, right? You know, the Galaxy S23 is their most recent uh, and uh, flagship. But now foldables are taking front and center, right? And so uh, at this uh, event that I went to in, in South Korea where they debuted this, it was the first time they had it in Seoul, mm. right? So it was a big deal. I mean, if you walked around uh, this area called the Coex uh, Center, it, it was just plastered with just 
digital billboards of Samsung uh, foldables. And so uh, they had TM Rowe, who's the head of uh, mobile for Samsung Global. Uh, Sydney Sweeney came out. Uh, one of the people from BTS, Sugar, came out. Uh, and so it was a, a big, big deal. And so they're clearly positioning this as the future of uh, their smartphone line as well as smartphones in general. Uh, and part of that then is to pull users from Apple and iOS over. And I mean, if, I swear if I hear this commercial ever again, it'll be too soon. Uh, they just kept playing it prior to the event kickoff, but it's about people saying, I would never uh, use a, an Android phone. And then it's someone flips open uh, a Z Fold, uh, Z Flip, excuse me, uh, and immediately runs to go buy one. Wow. So it's there clearly, I mean, you can't telegraph, it's not even telegraphing, I mean, they're just smashing you over the head with it. But, yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're really incredible pieces of, of, of technology. And, you know, I got to go in and see how they're actually built. Um, and the, the original fear was that they weren't going to be as sturdy as regular smartphones. But, I mean, they dunk them in, you know, water for a half hour, they blast them with dust. There was uh, one test where they have them in these giant, uh, I don't even know, contraptions, let's say, because I'm a 1930s prospector. Um, <laughs> and uh, they, you would put it in there, uh, like there were areas where you could put your hands in to feel what the temperature was. And one was ice cold. I mean, like you put your hand in, you're like, ah, that's good. And the other one uh, felt like just, I mean, like 98% humidity, like 115 something degrees. Right. Um, I imagine it's what like crawling into a Tauntaun was, like Han Solo and uh, uh, Empire Strikes Back. Um, really weird reference, but um, I mean, it, it was just incredible to see how they've gone from, you know, we have to pull these back to now they're up there with, you know, your regular smartphone as far right. as quality. Absolutely. All right. Well, this has been fascinating to watch as well. And, and that commercial itself sounds like the, uh, uh, just an example of text to go green, I guess. Oh, uh, yeah. Drake's fans out there. Uh, Dan, thanks so much for taking the trip and bringing some of these stories yeah, I'll back. Go, I'll this go wherever well. you guys want me to. Done deal. All right, we got a few more. <laughs>
uh, and as wide um, as expected, actually. And Samsung, although leading, I think, 80-plus 80, 80 percent of the, um, the foldable market, um, it's clearly not resonating as well with the higher-end um, user. And, and perhaps as well, you know, COVID probably didn't help because it's a very tactile experience, as, probably as, you, as you found um, when you, you get to use one, it's um, you've got to go and use it and touch it and realize, well, why do I need one of these when I've got my, my other piece of glass? So um, I can see why they're going that way because they want to differentiate their products at the higher end um, when they're competing with Apple, who don't have one of those devices at the moment. But it's uh, yeah, it's a challenge, and you know, it, it those creating the screen. Um, the hinge, the hinge, the amount of um, design that goes into that hinge is unbelievable, um, and they're still quite, still quite thick. Um, that's why I quite, I quite like the flip um, as more more than the fold, actually. But uh, uh, anyway, so um, yeah, I think they're doing the right things by pushing foldables, but whether they need Apple in there to really sort of spark in that market. Um, uh, to really get it going, because I see many have tried, that remains to be seen. Uh, Nabila, I want to ask you about why we're seeing Apple's market share creep up, right? This is the, uh, according to uh, IDC's numbers, one of the worst smartphone markets in, in decades. Um, is it just because they're playing in the premium segment? Uh, you know, is it that they're able to then push out and, I guess, attract? customers who are more interested in that? Is it because of upgrade cycles? Is it the, the iPhone 15 or presumably what's to, to be the 15? Um, what, what is the reason that, that Apple is kind of pulling away like this? So, you know, you've hit on, on, on so many points there. Um, so if you think about the whole smartphone market, right, let's just go top down. This, the entire market has been in decline since 2017, really, with the exception of 2021, We've been in six, seven consecutive years of decline. And while this is declining, app, the premium share has been going up. So from let's look at pre-pandemic and post, right? Um, pre-pandemic premium phones, which we classify as $800 plus, have gone from 10% share of the market to 20% now for the first half of 23. And a lot of premium, to be precise, 71% of premium market is Apple. And that's, you know, that shows you, perfect, the, the chart right there shows a trend that since 2019, Apple had only 63% share, and you can see Samsung was close to 30%. Samsung struggled with maintaining, and that's really been their, you know, their effort the last five years or so is to gain share with Apple in the premium segment. And that's, you know, as you can see, their share um, dipped as low as 15%, and that's right about when they dropped the note. Um, but in the last couple of years, they have, quickly recoup seven points of that share, reaching about you know 22% now. So it's really neck to neck. I think you know five years ago, you would say there was another third player viable, but now it's really um, an Apple and Samsung market. And this is your pain point because that's where the dollars are, right? Um, premium devices, 800 above the Although majority of the smartphone market is still you know below $400, um, but this is where the money is. So everyone, not to say that the other players don't want share of this premium, but they really, you know, they, it's very hard for any other brand name to, even if they were to launch a device, and they actually have in China, um, especially with the drop of Huawei, who had, you know, premium share and was neck to neck um, with Apple in, uh, in that market. Um, you know, once Huawei's dropped, and actually that's another point why Apple's numbers and share in the premium have gone up globally is their rise in China. Uh, with Huawei's decline, you know, Apple was a clear benefactor. Now almost a quarter of their shipments are coming from, from the China market. Um, but at that time, that's when the other players were, you know, with Huawei declining and other local brands, Chinese brands themselves, right? Beat, Oppo, Vivo, Xiaomi, really trying to get, and they launch devices, they push their premium products, but consumers, you know, are not going to spend, or they don't want to spend over $800 or $1,000 on a brand name that's not Apple or Samsung. So it's really been the Samsung and Apple rivalry. And that price is extremely important in in today's consideration for consumers. But you know the the cultural components are also extremely important too. And, and David, I wonder for a consumer that for decades now has had to think about the the cultural determining factor of their connectivity or the battery of their device or even the color of the bubbles that pop up when they're texting with someone. <laughs> what is the next cultural determining factor that could move this market one way or another? 
Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, good question. Because I, I think even going, going back to something like Apple, I mean, they, is it going to be the applications? Is it uh, you know, what services and what functions you can do on your phone or how it inter interacts with your TV at home or your smart home devices? Um, you know, is, is that going to be the next way forward where the device you use is not really that important? It's what you use it for. So your um, experience within... Uh, that product for portfolio you have. Um, I think that's that's going to be. I think that's going to become quite key moving forward. I think that the, the, the brands like Apple and Samsung have got to look at ways they can make money because, uh, as we just as just heard, you know, this market is really matured and it's slowing, um, and only the top guys, so Apple particularly, can squeeze any any money, any margin out of it. So how do they? How do they make money elsewhere? And and Samsung being a um, so going back to the sort of Samsung story, being a really a devices player, they don't own any platform. They don't have well, they don't anymore. Um, they don't have the app store that uh, Apple does. It sort of can fall back on that. So um, yeah, interesting because I mean on the one hand you've got all the, the different services and applications, and then there's the foldable and we have, we have rollable types of. Displays moving forward. I mean, again, very expensive, but are they going to are they going to come along sometime soon? So that whole ecosystem of the experience um, for the user, not necessarily device centric, that could be a way that brands will find you know a, a other ways of earning revenue or getting uh, revenue streams. I suppose the thing with Apple as well, you know, they've got their own ecosystem. They've really thought, thought, thought well and hard about creating that ecosystem so again back to that advert that samsung advert yes yeah, all very well but would they were all very well you know to drop it and go and get a, a, a flip phone but you've just invested lots of money in this apple ecosystem am i going to give that all away to go to android um you know and that's that's part <laughs> of the problem that I suppose consumers have on how you how the brands can extend into your you know, your life and user experiences oh yeah i i want to ask uh, Nabil, you know we're talking about the high-end market, you know, and I, I know that I think you were alluding to Huawei earlier saying that, you know, there used to be a third player uh, globally. And now uh, I believe it was yesterday or today, depending on the time zone you're in, but they announced a newer smartphone that uh, seems to be as though it can play in the high end market. So uh, they're developing their own chips, um, I guess, with a potential resurgence in Huawei. What does that then mean for the high end market? Uh, and for Apple and Samsung, especially in China, uh, where obviously you said, you know, 25% of Apple's shipments come from uh, and they've, they've become so dependent on. Sure, no, that, that's a great question and something we've been talking about the last few days internally and as well as, you know, um, and what we're definitely, if Huawei gets, you know, climbs back up, um, it, it's a big, uh, it's a big challenge for Apple, especially in China, because in China, it's, Samsung basically has no share there, and that's a one you know huge market um, that it's really that Apple's competing in and of itself. And right now, with no third, you know, with no second player, so if Huawei climbs back, and keep in mind, Huawei had majority share of the premium, uh, you know, significant share of the premium market in China for a while, and since you know the last few years, that's when it's gone down. So if they were to climb back up. It could it could really harm Apple's not just you know share in China but global volumes and and that could be a pain point and something to consider. But you know there are a lot of things up in the air and then we'll see. Yeah, on that front, Nabila, just quickly to finish us up, the big topic of conversation of the past few days has been this reported ban of iPhones yep. by Chinese government officials as well as at government sponsored enterprises. Do you think that's going to be a big problem for Apple? The the stock price is certainly behaving as though it might be. I mean, you know, many years ago when there was talks of the U.S. government banning Huawei and, you know, putting sanctions, there were, everyone's like, no, there's just, you know, there's, sometimes there's talks that don't really fall through, but then it happened with Huawei. So at this point, you know, given Apple's a big player, not just in the smartphone market, but for the China government or the China, you know, it, they manufacture, there's so much of the Chinese um, economy or industry, manufacturing industry, so dependent on Apple. So it'll be a really heavy trigger for for them to to pull through if they do so um you know right now i, I think it's anyone's guess but uh 
we, we, we just don't know, unfortunately. Yeah, that's a great point, though, about the interconnectedness, right? And still, even though Apple's trying to diversify, a lot of its phones are made there. <laughs> Nabila, thank you so much. Nabila Popal, IDC Research Director, and thanks to David McQueen, ABI Research Director, and of course, our Yahoo Finance Senior Tech Reporter, Dan Howley, who's going to be taking even more deep dives into the new frontiers of tech. For our next installment, Yahoo Finance's anchor, uh, Akiko Fujita, is exploring the possibilities of colonizing the moon. Let's take a look at a sneak peek. The future is unfolding at Astrobotics headquarters in Pittsburgh. Inside this vast facility, researchers are laying the groundwork for a reality once limited to science fiction, human life on the moon. We're walking into a, an area that has less than 10,000 parts per million in, in dust and debris in the air. So we need to be very, very clean to make sure that our dry skin or our hair or any, any debris that comes from us doesn't end up on the spacecraft. So the, the rise of commercial space is thriving right now and only projected to continue to grow. And the moon is gonna play a very important part of that. An hour into the trading session, let's do a check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade. We've got all three major averages that are now higher after sort of a meh opening when not much was moving. Now we've got the Nasdaq up by about two thirds of 1%, the S&P gaining a half percent, and the Dow up a third of 1%. We've got energy and uh, tech that is on the rise today, industrials bringing up the caboose, as Brad Smith likes to say. Hey, hey. 
And we've been talking a lot about Apple shares. They've been under pressure this week on reports that Chinese officials are asking government employees to stop using iPhones. The Wall Street analysts are skeptical of the band's long-term impact. 66% still have a buy rating on the stock. Wedbush's Dan Ives calling China concerns way overdone. But if history is to be believed, Apple stock may have further to fall and it's got nothing to do with China's rumored ban. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery, he's with us. He has been looking at the technicals. And yes. what they show is pretty fascinating. Yeah, it is. Uh, first of all, Apple, it's no surprise here, caught in a two, uh, actually a three-day, uh, I would say, loss here, even though we're up slightly today, taking away some of those uh, losses from the prior two days. Let's just take a look at what's happened this week. And then I'm going to get into why September is the worst month to be invested in Apple. But first, here you can see down 5%. That's worth about $180, $190 billion, give or take $10 billion. So that means a lot. And let's just take a look at the three-month chart because a shot off the bow was this drop in here. If I put some candlesticks in, you can see this was one day uh, drop there. And this was a record high only a few days before. And as I was researching this, I found at the time that that speed, the speed of the drop there from a record high, never been done before. And when it does happen this way, for instance, when we fall from grace and get oversold pretty quickly, uh, Apple stock does not re recover quickly. Now, a separate technical study here. I went back to uh, the beginning of Apple stock stock returns, uh, they began the IPO in 1980. And so the first full year is 1981. I took the average from 1981 to 2022 each month of the year. And here's what it would look like if you were invested only for that one month. I have August through December here. August, the second best month there, uh, second only to October. So October right around the corner. Well, let me tell you something. September is the absolute worst month. If you had $1,000 back in 1981 and you invested that only in the month of September, guess what it would be worth now? Eight. $80, so that's a loss of about uh, 90%. Uh, also, August is supposed to be a bumper month, yet that did not materialize, so here's another way of looking at this. Uh, Apple stock returns by month, but this is a bar graph. We can see if you had invested in uh, September, like I said, you'd be down 92%. August up 637%, uh, October 750%. But why do I believe that may not be around the corner here this October? And that's because of the situation with Apple's declining revenues. And that is something that Sanford Bernstein has been talking about recently. And I think there's some merit to it. They're comparing Apple's performance from 2015 to what IBM did back in the day from 1997 to 2012. And this corresponds to this stock run up that you're seeing right here in IBM stock. What happened after that? Well, they had about 20 quarters of declining revenue and the stock price took a hit. And over the last five years, it's not a disaster, but you can see it is just trading sideways here. So Apple, if it's going to fall from grace, I don't think it's going away, but it might just become a slightly more boring company. We'll have to see. All right, that's interesting, mm. especially given the fact that what takes place usually during September, their huge iPhone event. Yes. So we'll see if that moves the dial one way or the other. Ironically Jared. enough, September was a terrible, terrible month for, uh, for Apple going back way before the iPhone was invented. Wow. Always has been for some reason. Wow. Mm. Really interesting. Jared, thanks for bringing that to us and our attention, our own Jared Blickery. Also, everyone, we've got much more markets action on the other side of this short break. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We keep talking about the student loan repayments coming back. I mean, this is something we've been looking ahead to, looking ahead to, looking ahead to. It's finally going to be happening as of October. How much of an effect is it really going to have? I think it's one of those things that's just another data point when it comes to the health of the consumer and another reason why we could see volatility going into the end of this year. If inflation proves to be stickier, if we start to see more of a deterioration in the employment backdrop, then you're going to see consumers making the decisions that they've been making all year in terms of the nice to have versus need to have, and they're going to focus more on the need to have.
What you for that? It's been a rocky year for markets, but what will the light at the end of the tunnel be? Our next guest believes that it might be tech ETFs. In studio today, we've got Brian Lake, who is the JP Morgan Asset Management Global Head of ETF Solutions. Why tech ETFs then? Well, you know, I, I think when we look at what's been happening in the markets, we see some of these companies that have been able to uh, rally um, pretty significantly this year. When you think about what the NASDAQ has been able to do um, year to date, it's rallied, you know, north of 30 percent. That wasn't exactly how people thought the markets were going to uh, go this year. If you think back to January, people were really worried coming into this year. Um, now, what I think is interesting is looking forward mm -hmm. is, yes, you do have a good outlook, but, but can it do another 30%? I think that's the question. And so one of the strategies that we're seeing investors look a lot at is a, is a strategy called uh, our NASDAQ equity premium income strategy. The ticker is JEPQ. So it owns the growth companies that you know in the NASDAQ, NVIDIA, Microsoft, some of these other uh, names like that. But it also has a covered call um, component to it, uses options to help drive income above and beyond that. So it's giving you a nice monthly distribution, it's yielding north of 10% right now, which can both contribute income, but also protect uh, to, the to the downside in case this market does have a little bit of a wobble towards the end of the year. Now, one of the things that you're sort of alluding to is this shift that we've seen in ETFs towards a more active management within the ETF wrapper. And the industry has been pushing that way for a little while. We've seen growth. It's still a small percentage of the overall total. What do you think would sort of tip the scales or cause the active ETF game to gain a little more momentum? I, I, I think the scales have tipped. I, I think active ETFs had a breakout year in 2022. Here's the stats, and, and, and you're right, active ETFs only make up about 5% of overall ETF AUM. So we've got about $7 trillion in ETF assets here in the US, about 5% of that is in active ETFs. Going into 2022, Active ETFs are 5%. They accounted for more than 20% of the net flows across 2022, last year. And that continued in 2023. In fact, year to date, active ETFs are accounting for about 30% of the net flows into the ETF space. So investors are absolutely embracing active ETFs. But it's still only 5% of the total? Yeah, but like think about the market rallied this right, much. It's yeah. like, so it's growing as part of the pie, Got but the it. pie is growing at the same time. Now, you're making a really interesting point. And I think this is what the, where the penny finally dropped for investors. The ETF is a technology, use the word wrapper. The ETF is a technology, it trades throughout the day, it's tax efficient, it's transparent. It has all these other benefits that investors uh, really appreciate. I, I, I talk about it gives investors control. The ETF wrapper gives them control. What you put inside of that is just as important. And to your point, you've had a lot of indexes that have been delivered through the, the ETF wrapper, and that's a great use in portfolios as well. But when you can use proprietary active management like what JP Morgan does, we, we pride ourselves on that. So we have 1,000 uh, investors around the world. We invest $400 million in active management research every single year. Our proprietary active management, we're taking our best investment capabilities, the best thinking across JP Morgan, and then delivering it through the convenient ETF wrapper. And I think investors are now saying, oh, I think this is a really important piece of how I can build better portfolios. And that's why we're seeing the flows that, that I referenced earlier. And so is, you know, we've kind of seen the volatility play out over the course of the, the past month and change. Yeah. Where we're kind of staring down right now is a Q4 where we're going to get a little bit more inclination about how the consumer is comfortable. But then even beyond that, for a lot of investors that are looking at their portfolio and saying, I've got a longer term time horizon, and some of these ETFs I might be comfortable with holding on for a long period of time, but others going into an election season or election year as well, yeah might where they may be a little bit more skittish to, to perhaps go yeah. gung-ho into yeah. them. What, what is that usual performance, even as some economists, some investors are also starting to look at an election year? So, so you raise a great point. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's some, some clouds kind of out on the horizon. Is the Fed going to go one more time? Kind of question mark. Market's kind of saying maybe not, but, but, but could. Um, is there a recession out there? We've talked about kind of the no landing, soft landing, high landing, like there's all sorts of landings that are going on, but mm -hmm. can, going back to my early point, can what we've had so far this year continue? And I think investors are saying, gosh, I don't think we can do another 30% on top of what we've already done this year. And so there's questions out there. Um, what I do know is now that rates are where they are, they play a very important part of the portfolio. So what we're seeing a lot of investors do is rebalance towards active fixed income. So they're using active fixed income in their portfolio. Why active? Well, the, the, the easy way to start this one is passive fixed income has some limitations. It overweights the biggest debtor 
in the index. So if you think about how the passive indexes are created, the, the biggest debtor, the person, the, the companies that have borrowed the most money mm -hmm. are the biggest weight within the passive indexes. That's not typically how investors think about their fixed income allocations. And so when you use active management, security selection of those bonds, understanding the duration risk, understanding the credit quality, matching up income with what investors are trying to achieve in their portfolios, and now that they have attractive yields, so we have a, another strategy, uh, JPIE, it's the income fund, yield to maturity of about 6.5%, so yield to maturity would be your, kind of your expected annualized return, it's got a duration of about 3.5 years, 6.5% pretty attractive. If you think about equity risk premia, like the, the academics will tell you over hundreds of years, equity risk premia, you know, kind of four, four or five plus a little div, maybe you're getting 6% on that. If you can get that in the safety of bonds, maybe that's a nice way to, to, to position your portfolio with some of the uncertainty that's out there. All right, Brian, we got to leave it there. Thank you so much. Brian Lake, JP Morgan Asset Management, Global Head of ETF Solutions. All right, we got much more coming up. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. What is the thing that you most want to avoid in the market right now? I would say market timing. There's a lot of dynamics about um, either being all in, all out, and look at what's happened year to date. I don't think anyone was anticipating the rally that we've seen in U.S. equities. So this idea of just being balanced, staying invested, um, staying diversified, and not trying to time these markets. Goldman Sachs' Communicopia and Technology Conference, it's come to a close, and Yahoo Finance was front and center, bringing you key interviews all week long. Our executive editor, Brian Sazi, is back from San Francisco, here with us to bring us his top takeaways. Saz, in true fashion, you did 137 interviews. You talked to <laughs> 4,362 people. It's not people. over. I'm still feeling it. This conference <laughs> is not over. It's still going on. We have interviews running throughout the day. Uh, yeah, a couple top takeaways um, ahead of the weekend as I reflect on everything. Um, this whole room, the whole conference was packed. The attendance year over year, I would say, was higher. Uh, the, the names in this room, I would argue, were bigger year over year, and, and they were very cool to very cool to see them on our platform. But a couple takeaways for me: one, uh, Coinbase. Uh, is on a collision course with the SEC next year. Now, we have a, a full piece, uh, on a written text story on the Yahoo Finance homepage on this, looking at what Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong uh, told me at the conference about his battle with the SEC and how that might play out uh, next year. So that is something to watch. Just spending a little time uh, with Brian. It was the first time he was on with Yahoo Finance. I think he's remains very focused on, on realizing that value for Coinbase. And he has to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with SEC Gary Gensler. My sense of just spending 15 minutes with him, I think he's ready to do it. Next.
next Peloton has real problems. You saw the stock sell off uh, middle of the week. You saw Liz Coddington, the CFO of Peloton. Really, I give, I would say, give a, a worrisome presentation talking about uh, some unexpected challenges, having to invest more in the business, maybe uh, more than they thought. Major red flag, the stock got hit. Uh, probably not a good year for them next year. Number three, didn't feel like the big merger was in the room. Just talking to a lot of execs there, they remain very focused not on cutting expenses, which was the tone last year. This year, I think a lot of execs are figuring out ways to grow that top line and prove their sales next year. And then a bonus one, too. You know, uh, you never know what you're going to see at some of these big conferences. Uh, and to that end, you know, we're getting off doing an interview with at and uh, CEO John Stanky. He's on the left there. He came on with us, got that video on there. Up comes David Zasloff. Uh, Warner Brothers uh, CEO was really working the room all week, constantly seeing him on the phone on the second floor, shaking hands with uh, uh, Stanky. Now these two made a big deal more than a year ago. You saw Stanky on the left unload that hot potato that is CNN and those Warner Media assets to Zaslov. They smile, they I talk. I was going to say, that's why Stanky looks He's a lot like, happier in this I've picture. I got you, bro. <laughs> that steaming pile is yours right now. But look, uh, they, were, they remain what appears to be friends, whatever that might mean. They talked for 10 minutes uh, after that photo. They were all smiles and away they went. Compadres. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. how it goes. Many of these leaders as well, perhaps those two included, talked about AI. <laughs> what? So much AI, Brad. Yeah. <laughs> AI overload? Yeah, look, we, uh, we actually did a, a fusion, a fusion, I would say, a supercut, a fusion, whatever it is, of, of execs telling us about how they plan to use uh, AI into the next uh, decade here. Take a listen. There's lots of interesting discussion we can have around AI. I think any creative would admit that AI is transformative to how they think about and how they concept new ideas. There's a lot of hype in our industry. I think this may be underhyped. There certainly needs to be a lot of debate about AI and journalism. 57% of newsroom jobs in the United States have been lost. AI is gonna change this whole industry completely. And so we're thinking a lot about how do we use AI to match people a lot better um, and to support the conversations that are happening. All the conversations on AI, I think it was that rare interview uh, that we got. We got to spend some time with News Corp CEO Robert Thompson, really an OG in journalism, started his career in the late 70s, of course leads Wall Street Journal, Barron's, you name it, but how AI may impact our field over the next decade, not just taking journalism jobs, but how stories are told and presented mm. to, uh, to society. All right, some really compelling stories. Even more of those interviews are going to continue to run. Thanks so much, Saz. Yep. Absolutely. All right, get some rest. Yeah, yeah. no. No, he can't no. because... No. Because he's got an interview with <laughs> Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon. That's coming up today at 3 p.m. Eastern time. You do not want to miss that. So Can we get some AI to do that? <laughs> for you, for there, there's data right now in Times Square. All right, <laughs> yep, live. Well, live later on. That is AI. All your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. <laughs> Are we going to continue to see a slump in stocks from here? I think we're going to continue to see some volatility. There's a lot of catalysts that are on the horizon from the CPI print, the trajectory of the Fed, um, looking at earnings and the health of the consumer. So while it may not be a slump, I think we'll see some choppy markets from here to the end of the year.
The G20 summit is happening again in India this time. And it seems like it could be a big year given that both China's Xi Jinping and Russia's Vladimir Putin are deciding not to attend. And President Biden is thought to get other world leaders to align with him on matters like the Ukraine-Russia war and offsetting China's influence in the Indo-Pacific. But is it something that will make significant waves or is it more political banter? Those two big questions here. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman to give us some insights and some answers as well. Hey, Rick. Hey, guys. Uh, you know, a lot of Americans are feeling pretty bummed out about uh, their country. But uh, America is set to shine at this uh, at this uh, global summit of large nations known as the G20 summit. I mean, as you pointed out, uh, leaders of China and Russia won't be there. Uh, that so uh, you know, U.S. stepping into the absence. Look at what's happening in China. They got all kinds of economic problems, and it looks like maybe their uh, era of miracle growth is over. And as for Russia. Once the other superpower in the world, uh, their president, Vladimir Putin, is under indictment for war crimes. He's not going anywhere where he might get arrested. And of course, Russia may also be in permanent decline because of uh, its disastrous uh, invasion of Ukraine and all the sanctions that are uh, on Russia at this point and all, all the uh, money it's pouring into that war. So Biden will kind of be holding the stage there along with uh, Modi of India. And as you pointed out, uh, this is an opportunity for the United States to say to some emerging nations, maybe it'd rather align with us uh, than China, who uh, has maybe seen its best days in the past. And certainly who would want to align with Russia at this point? Um, you know, this this could make a difference down the road. It could affect things such as trade. Um, so, you know, some of the countries that we get our uh, our imports from after this event, uh, Biden is going to Vietnam, which is an increasingly important source of trade for the United States. Some of the stuff that we used to get from China is actually now uh, going to Vietnam and which coming into the United States from Vietnam. There are no uh, additional tariffs on imports from Vietnam as there are on imports from China, which Trump did. So um, that's an example of the type of uh, influence uh, Biden may be trying to spread around at this meeting of uh, foreign nations. And Rick, um, you alluded to this earlier, that even though he is trying to gain that support overseas, that sentiment back home is not necessarily fantastic. And that is now being reflected in some of the polling around and looking ahead to 2024. Yeah, I, I, I mean, this was a bit of a watershed a week for uh, polling that really shows the concern American have, Amer Americans have with Joe Biden's age. So there have been several polls uh, this week and in prior weeks that say e even Democrats, uh, you know, majority, a strong majority, solid majority of Democrats say Biden should not run again. It should be somebody else. Around 70, 75 percent uh, in a variety of polls say Biden is too old to be president. Uh, and this is he can't remediate this. I mean, uh, he's only going to get older, obviously. So, you know, the old saying, it's the economy, stupid, that every president needs to just focus on the economy. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe if, uh, for once in the 24, 24 election cycle, it will not be the economy, stupid, because uh, the economy is in pretty good shape. And it's arguably getting better as the inflation rate falls. The Federal Reserve is probably done hiking interest rates and so on. We don't uh, have a recession. We do have a soft landing. Goldman Sachs, yet another forecast for improving its outlook for the U.S. economy this week. And Biden is getting no credit for this. It's as if voters look at Biden and all they see is the fact that he's 80, turning 81, uh, and he would be 86 if he finishes a second term. Um, so, uh, you know, this is feeling like a moment of reckoning for Biden when maybe he has to look in the mirror and say, I am pretty old. Um, maybe he does that already, just not publicly. I don't know, Rick. <laughs> we'll find out. Rick Newman, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hi, guys. Well, Yahoo Finance, Michelle Akufo has got you for the next hour of trading. Have a great weekend, everybody.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching this Friday. Walmart has announced it's slashing starting pay for employees. So what does this say about the state of the labor market? We'll discuss coming up this hour. And bracing for student loan repayments. What should borrowers be prepared for? We'll speak with an expert coming up. Plus, another development in the legal battle of Disney versus DeSantis, why the media giant is dropping everything but its free speech claim against the Florida governor. We'll break that down for you coming up. But first, let's take a look at how the major indices are faring this morning. Looking at green across the board, though, during this, da- this shortened trading week, they are down for the week. But the Dow, at least, up right now about 90 points or about a third of a percent. The S&P 500 there also up by about a third of a percent there. We're seeing energy and utilities, the leading sectors this morning. Tech heavy Nasdaq, they're also up about 21 points there, although AI darling NVIDIA in the red under some pressure this morning. Let's also check in on the Treasury market as well, as this will be the last day before the Fed enters its quiet period. We see the five-year down down about 0.7% there. The 10-year also losing a little bit of ground there at 0.92% in the red today. And also taking a look at the longer-term 30-year yield down in similar territory, down about 0.94%. Well, economic data out of the U.S. this week has been pretty much positive, which has put investors on edge. Now, a strong economy could mean more rate hikes and limit the possibility of a soft landing. Initial jobless claims dropped for the week of September 2nd to its lowest level since February, showing that the labor market remains resilient. Well, now the Fed is meeting again in just a couple of weeks and investors are expecting a pause in rate hikes this time, but more and more anticipating more tightening later in the year. Now, we've heard from some Fed leaders recently who sound pretty positive about where we are. Let's start with Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby on Thursday, seemingly leaning towards an end to rate hikes, saying that we're approaching a place where it isn't about how high rates should go, but, quote, how long do we need to keep the rates at this position before we're sure that we're back on the path to the target? And Federal Reserve Bank of New York President John Williams recently said, quote, I think we've got monetary policy in a very good place in terms of in terms of we have a restrictive stance on policy. Well, joining me now is Matt Stuckey, Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management Senior Portfolio Manager for Equities. Thank you for joining me this morning. So obviously we're getting our, our last bits of Fed speak today before they enter that blackout period ahead of the September meeting. Um, what sort of position do you think the Fed is now in at the end of this week of economic data? Look, we think, broadly speaking, the Fed's in a restrictive state just in terms of what the impact has been so far on the economy. You've seen the economy decelerate the last 12 months or so. Um, you know, we think from here, it's likely that we are very close to the end of this current hiking cycle. We might get another increase of the Fed funds rate in November. It's unlikely that we'll see it in September here. Uh, but we're getting close to the end. Uh, but the important point here is not necessarily so much the future direction in terms of an incremental hike or so. It's it's the extent to which the Fed is going to keep rates elevated at a restrictive level. Uh, and to that point, we do think it's going to be a while until they start to cut. I mean, Dallas Fed President Lori Logan also weighed in saying, you know, a skip in rate hikes would be appropriate, referring to the September meeting, which is widely expected, especially based on the CME Fed watch tool as well. But she also said that in today's complex economic environment, returning inflation to 2% will require a carefully calibrated approach, not endless buckets of cold water, essentially saying this, this pace that we've been seeing of these rate hikes, as you mentioned, they're coming to a close here. But then What's next then in terms of a soft landing? Because you said there's a low probability of that happening. Yeah, and, and just to touch uh, again on, on kind of where the Fed's at and what they're looking for to eventually start to uh, reduce rates. The, the Fed is, labor, is laser focused on the labor market and with wage levels and, and the growth of wages still elevated above 4%, you know, just ticking down uh, that 4.5% with the, labor, the latest labor market report, that's still too high for the comfort level of the Federal Reserve. Um, and to that extent, to my earlier comment, uh, we think that they're likely to stay in restrictive territory. Now, you brought up, you know, the likelihood of a soft landing. I, I think anytime we're talking about a Fed hiking cycle, recession needs to be our base case versus soft landing. And here's why. You'll go through every Fed hiking cycle since World War II. There's been 13 of them. 
10 out of 13 of those hiking cycles have resulted in some form of a technical U.S. recession. Of course, you know, there's more significant and severe ones versus more milder versions of a recession. But, yeah, I think the idea with those odds that, you know, we're, we're pointing towards a soft landing, I think, is just uh, isn't synonymous with history. In fact, if you kind of uh, you know, force me to make a call in terms of are we going to have a higher likelihood of recession versus the historical norm or a lower uh, probability versus the historical norm, I would actually lean towards higher. And here's why. It's, we've been in the fastest and steepest um, kind of reversal of monetary policy in, in, in the form of this hiking cycles in, in over 40 years. And we really haven't felt the lagged effects of kind of all of this running through the financial system. Um, and so, you know, we'll stay tuned, but we're, we're kind of more in the camp of, of recessionary outcome versus soft landing. And one of the things that you note is what you're seeing with uh, balance sheets for households, uh, corporate and banks as well. But I mean, we are still seeing cracks when it comes to the, the household balance sheets. People are mm -hmm. still spending, but they're also taking on a lot of debt at the moment as well. So what would you say has, poses the biggest risk of the three at the moment from what you're seeing? You know, I, I think household balance sheets are probably where we need to focus a little bit more on uh, for a couple of reasons. One is you know, we've seen an elevated spending profile from consumers that has really been aided by excess liquidity, liquidity that was still left over from the pandemic. That's been winding down throughout this year and should likely uh, be exhausted by the start of the fourth quarter. In addition to that, you do have the student loan uh, resumption of payments hitting discretionary spending. Uh, and over time, what you'll likely see is, um, you know, the the lagged impacts of, of Fed tightening in the form of higher interest rates dampening down consumer demand. Um, you know, it's it's not all a bad picture though. If you look at kind of leverage profiles of the consumer balance sheet relative to where we went into the last couple of recessions, they, it's still a good story, but there is pressure there. Uh, and so, if we're looking for deterioration uh, on the forefront um, in terms of what's likely to happen with the consumer, there's a lot of evidence that. Uh, headwinds are forming. And just quickly, Matt, I know you see opportunities in U.S. mid and small caps. What sort of timeline are you looking at, factoring in that recession that perhaps some of these estimates have pushed it out to, to 2024, mid to late 2024? Yeah, we do prefer a little bit more of a value approach in our asset allocation positioning. And what foots that bill today is, for us is U.S. small cap and mid caps. However, those areas of the market tend to be a little bit more economically sensitive. And so for us, you know, we're adjusting our time horizon uh, with those views in mind and the reality that those asset classes are more economically sensitive. Um, and so to us, it's more of an intermediate to longer term uh, overweight in our portfolio with the understanding that it's likely to be choppy if we're correct with our recession call. But we're getting such a nice discount in terms of kind of where these asset classes are trading versus U.S. large caps. And the reality is, is that some of the weakness that we expect in the form of recession is already priced into the asset class. If we're looking at earnings revisions for U.S. small caps and mid caps, we've already seen expectations marked down 14, 15 percent. And against those reduced expectations, we're only being asked to pay 13 or 14 times forward earnings. Um, that's a stark contrast to the U.S. large cap. Uh, asset class where you know, really earnings haven't been marked down much at all, and against uh, against kind of those those you know healthy earnings revisions, um, we're still being asked to pay 19, 20 times forward earnings. So you know we we like the the valuation disconnect that we get in the U.S. small and mid cap uh, areas. We just um, uh, understand that it's going to be a longer term overweight position. Uh, required as a uh, from us as investors to kind of achieve those excess returns longer term. And certainly a different stance than people sort of trying to chase some of this FOMO that we're seeing in the tech right. rally that we've seen so far this year. Appreciate you joining us this morning, Matt Stuckey, Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management Senior Portfolio Manager for Equities. Thank you for your time and have a great weekend. Well, Walmart is revamping its pay structure. Some new entry-level workers will, make, will be making less than they would if they'd started a few months ago at America's largest private employer. Yahoo Finance reporter Brooke De Palma is here with the details. Hey, Brooke. 
Good morning, Rochelle. That's right. A Walmart spokesperson confirming to Yahoo Finance that in mid-July, the company did pay, change its pay structure. So what exactly does this mean? Well, it means that future entry-level employees will be making the same now. So this goes for cashiers, stockers, which is employees filling fulfilling shelves, as well as online grocery personal shoppers, those employees who fulfill online orders or at-home delivery orders, they will all be making the same. Now, in the past, stockers, as well as those online grocery personal shoppers, did make about $1 more. Now, that Walmart spokesperson telling Yahoo Finances this, this was not a push to make their pay more consistent, saying, quote, consistent starting pay results in consistent staffing and better customer service while also creating new opportunities for associates to gain new skills from experience across the store and lay the groundwork for their career regardless of where they start. Now, when it comes to current existing employees, their base pay did not change. And that Walmart spokesperson also added that this new pay structure actually provided a wage increase for approximately 50,000 employees. Now, Walmart's higher skilled jobs such as those bakery, those cake decorators, deli workers, as well as auto care centers still will pay more. And so Walmart really saying here that this was to provide those entry level positions to be more consistent so that those workers have more flexibility to try different roles. So more about uh, leveling the playing field there versus, you know, cutting some of these salaries while, you know, as we see the announcements from UPS, people making 170. So good to get some context there. So then, Brooke, what is Wall Street saying about this change? Yeah, Rochelle, well, some urging that this is part of a bigger story about the current labor market that we're seeing and that there might be some easing there. In addition to that, you have to know here that, as you mentioned before, Walmart is the biggest private employer. They employ about 1.6 million employees. And so more, more so, Walmart really comes as the indicator about what we're seeing in the broader economy. And Corey Tarlow of Jeffries, an analyst, they are saying, quote, net net, we don't believe that this change will have a material impact on Walmart's payroll. However, this news does indicate that the labor market uh, tightness is easing more broadly. And Sutri Codelli, for Forrest or um, retail analyst, also saying that she does wonder if this could be something bigger that we could expect to see in the economy. She also added that this will definitely trickle into other retailers. And it's important to note here that whatever Walmart sets precedent of, often we see other retailers then follow suit. Earlier this year, Walmart did announce an investment to increase its average hourly pay to $17.50. Shortly after that, we heard from Home Depot in February that they, they plan to invest $1 billion in wages. And so, of course, we're seeing the labor market continuing to cool here. But in addition to that, we're really seeing retailers take a different stand than maybe they have before when it comes to recruiting, maintaining talent, and also offering their employees different opportunities. And you raise a good point. We'll definitely keep an eye to see if others follow Walmart's example there. Big thank you to our very own Brooke De Palma. Thanks so much. All right, shifting gears now. Today, the FAA grounds SpaceX. The so-called Starship Super Heavy rocket will not be seeing space anytime soon. That's after the FAA launched a probe following its mid-flight explosion in April. The agency says the company needs to make 63 corrective actions before it's cleared for another test flight and blamed, quote, multiple root causes. Now, this is a blow to Elon Musk as there have been talks of a future IPO for the space exploration company. Earlier this week, the Washington Post reported that Musk, the largest shareholder of the company, tapped SpaceX for a $1 billion loan as he was completing his buyout of Twitter, now known as X. All right, all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Any back to school tips or things that you try to utilize? Well, first of all, I don't know. If, I don't know if you have kids. If I you... have two boys, two okay. boys. They started this week. All right. And so, like, how do you get ready? I try to make sure they have their supplies, they have their agendas. We already lost a water bottle, so uh, I am- Already? I know, I'm getting a solid like <laughs> C plus on back to school. <laughs> yeah, I try to stress not too much about the whole thing.
Let's do a check of the market, sponsored by Tasty Trade. Still seeing green across, across the board. The Dow, though, picking up steam now, up 102 points there, about a third of a percent. S&P 500, they're also seeing some gains, but still trading in a relatively narrow range, up about 15 points. Energy and utilities leading the way. Industrials, a little bit on the struggle bus, the worst performing sector so far this morning. Tech heavy Nasdaq also up just over a third of a percent, or 46 points. Also seeing NVIDIA, though, under some pressure this morning as well. Well, Disney has slashed down its federal lawsuit against Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, the company now focusing only on its free speech claim. DeSantis politically retaliated against the company. Now, this marks the latest legal wrinkle in the ongoing Disney-DeSantis battle. The drama kicked off last year when Disney publicly denounced DeSantis' Don't Say Gay Bill. So how did we get here? Well, Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal and Rick Newman join me now. So, um, Ali, I'll start with you first. Yeah, Rochelle, well, you're right. This is essentially a narrowing of that federal lawsuit. The big one, the First Amendment free speech claim is still there, which is that Governor DeSantis retaliated against the company due to its stance on the Parental Rights and Education Act, otherwise known as the Don't Say Gay Bill. That bill is now a law which prevents the education of sexual identity uh, and gender from kindergarten to third grade in public schools. So while that element of the lawsuit is still intact, Disney did drop its other claims, which centered on the company's development contracts. And Disney, in a statement, said they are still going to aggressively focus on those contracts, which allow it to invest billions in the state of Florida and therefore create thousands of jobs. So this has really been a back and forth tit for tat that has lasted for well over a year at this point with multiple counterclaims and suits from both sides. You're seeing the timeline right there there on your screen. And this actually all stems back to when former CEO Bob Chapek was at the company. Chapek initially was silent on the bill and he worked behind the scenes that ultimately failed. And he publicly denounced the bill later on, which led to the political firestorm we see today. It was one of the many reasons why he was ousted at the company in November. But I want to make clear that Disney is not backing down in any way. Bob Iger has remained very committed saying that DeSantis's practices are both anti-business and anti-Florida. Now, on the flip side of that, Governor DeSantis in an interview with CNBC in August said that he's moved on from the lawsuit and that Disney should drop it at this point. So clearly more to come on this. It's not over yet, Rochelle. Indeed. So, Rick, I want to bring you in here because obviously this became a, you know, an, an anti-woke versus woke argument. It became this political football here. In terms of the optics and who's really coming out ahead in this optic game, is it DeSantis or is it Disney at this point? Well, DeSantis, I think, is not getting the traction that he wants to get by taking on what he calls woke capitalism. Uh, and I would add to what Ali said, there is still state uh, litigation going on that is going to determine things such as whether Disney uh, can continue its uh, independent um, status uh, with regard to its governing district down there. So we still have the narrowed federal case and the state litigation. And I think DeSantis at this point just wishes it would all go away, <laughs> which is one of the reasons he said, hey, Disney, why don't you just knock it off? Um, Disney's not going to do that. Um, and it's worth pointing out that in his book, which came out earlier this year, uh, DeSantis devoted a whole chapter to his battle with Disney. And he really bragged about uh, taking on Disney and the woke establishment. Uh, so fast forward a few months to over the summer when he, uh, when DeSantis gave a big speech in New Hampshire outlining his economic vision. He did not use the phrase woke a single time. He did not mention Disney a single time either. So I I read that is an indication that uh, DeSantis has been trying out this theme on the campaign trail. He's trying to figure out ways where he can kind of stay aligned with Donald Trump, but also distinguish himself from Donald Trump. 
I think he tried out the crusade against woke capitalism as one way to do that. I just I just don't think it has worked. So um, I think that we're not going to hear DeSantis saying a lot more about it, because at this point um, he could lose in court. He could lose in court at the same time. Uh, the 2024 election is in full swing. And I think he just wants people to focus on something else. And Ali, as Rick was saying there, obviously DeSantis saying he wishes, you know, that it would all go away, basically saying he's he's moved past it. How much is Disney, though, still going to be focusing on this versus, say, the broader parts of its business? I think for Disney, this is not fundamental to the business. Bob Iger has said that they haven't seen a reduction in park attendance, specifically due to this firestorm. Also, Disney has a lot of other issues at the company, right? I mean, they're still bleeding money on the streaming side of things. Their box office titles, they haven't performed as well. We still have the issue of succession hanging over everyone's head. And then they want to take ESPN fully over the top as a direct-to-consumer streaming service. So for Disney as a company, this seems to be a, a little bit of a sideshow for them. There are fundamental business problems that they need to address first. Obviously, this lawsuit, an overhang in the background, uh, this back and forth political firestorm, obviously not great PR for a company that prides itself as being the happiest place on earth. But I think fundamentally, it, it doesn't really affect Disney's business. And they really need to focus on their sinking stock price and a lot of other issues at the company. And Bob Iger has made that clear as well. It might affect the state of Florida more than it affects right. Disney. Uh, Disney has made clear that uh, they're reconsidering uh, whether to invest money in Florida. They could put it somewhere else. And a lot of business people in Florida are asking themselves, is this a pro-business state or not? And that's what it'll come down to indeed. And obviously both DeSantis and Disney have bigger fish to fry. But as you mentioned there, something that would be perhaps more Florida specific, especially when it comes to business investment. A big thank you there to our very own Ali Canal and Rick Newman. Thank you to you both. Have a great weekend. Yep. Yeah. Well, after years of holding out hope that their student debt would be forgiven, borrowers are bracing for repayments to begin. The numbers behind student debt are staggering. More than 43 billion folks across the U.S. carry an average federal student loan debt balance of more than $37,000. That's according to the Education Data Initiative. Now, come October, how should borrowers prioritize paying off their debts? Well, I'm joined now by Lawrence Sprung, author of Financial Planning Made Personal and founder of Midland Financial. Great to have you on the show, Lawrence. So a lot of people bracing for these payments to, to start kicking back in. What is the first step they should take, knowing that they're now going to have this, this extra chunk of money coming out of their accounts? So be prepared. Start, you know, if they haven't already, they should have had, you know, do it right now, get a budget together. Take a look at income coming in, expenses going out. If they have a surplus that can cover these expenses, fantastic. If they don't, start looking at areas that they could potentially cut out of their budget. There might be subscriptions, things that they're paying monthly for that they no longer need, that they can immediately cut out that could go towards these student loan payments. And if not, look at your current providers. Maybe you could contact them and negotiate your monthly price down. I've done that successfully myself and it's been extremely helpful. So you wanna make sure that you're freeing up the room and you're 100% prepared for these payments to resume and that they fit into your budget. I'm sure a lot of people are going to start getting inundated by sort of student loan repayment companies, really not sure which ones they should be following, which ones are legit, which ones might be a scam just because they see the news cycle here. How should people pick out the best student loan repayment options out there for them? I, I think you have to be very careful. You bring up a great point, Rochelle. There are a lot of options. There's been a lot of things presented and put across the table in terms of how people could potentially reduce their, their payments or even their outstanding obligations. The important thing is go to the federal websites, take a look at what options are available to you and what makes the most sense for you and your family because there are some good options that are currently available uh, like the save program which is currently in process you could go online and apply for that if you're eligible that may immediately cut your payments and potentially forgive your debt a lot earlier than you had expected so when people are trying to weigh going the the save the biden administration save program versus other options what should they keep in mind how should they be calculating it I think they have to look at three things, really. They have to look at how are their payments today going to be affected, number one. 
Number two is how are their balances going to change going forward? Are they going to continue to grow through the programs that they're looking towards or are they gonna remain the same? And then three, is there an availability for the balance to be forgiven at some point? Those are three things that you can easily look at and compare between all the options. And then it's a matter of deciding what's in your best interest. And for people who are trying to balance, look, I have, you know, rent going up, used car prices are too high. Some people might be like, look, let me just let this thing go delinquent. What should they keep in mind if they're like, I'm just not going to pay it or they're trying to put it in out of their mind and some of the consequences they should be aware of? So it is a challenge, right? You know, especially in this uh, environment that we're in, things have gone up and now you have this added expense. So number one is there's the on-ramp program. So my understanding is nobody's going to be penalized if they can't or they don't pay enough for the first 12 months. Uh, there's gonna be somewhat of an on-ramp process to this loan repayment starting. So they should be aware of that. If they ultimately have or choose to go delinquent, you have to be aware of the consequences. There could be a situation where this balance may still be overhanging you. There could be some kind of, you know, federal government lien against if you're getting a tax refund that may be conf confiscated or withheld and applied to that tax, uh, you know, that tax obligation or your student loan obligation. The other thing that you have to be aware of, which kind of stays with you for a long time, is it could affect your credit rating. And that not only will affect you today, that affects you in the future on purchases, whether it be a car loan, car lease, your car insurance. Having a stellar credit rating is extremely valuable and that may impact it. And Lawrence, I want to just quickly ask you about best ways to pay off debt because there's the snowball method where you sort of you start with the smallest debt that you have, pay that off and then keep applying those to the others versus the one that has the biggest interest rate or the, the highest debt. How should people approach paying off their debt? Whatever they're going, whatever's going to be the most easy for them to use and do, right? If they need those small wins and using that snowball approach where they're paying off the smaller debt and they feel like a win because they've rid themselves of that debt, then that is a, a method that they should be using. If they're simply looking to lower their overall monthly expenses and the amount of interest they're paying, then for those individuals, tackle those balances that have the largest interest rates. They may be the largest balances, so it may really be the opposite of the snowball effect, but really it's about what are you going to feel good about at the end of the day? What's gonna make the most sense for you and your family? You know, we talk about it in financial planning, made personal all the time. These are personal decisions. Some people are gonna love having that win out of the gate, and if they have five debts outstanding at the end of the month, knowing they only have one. Others wanna know that their interest payments are going down. So evaluate the decisions, see what's going to be in your best interest and make the most sense for you and start and stay active with it and continue to knock down those debts. It's true because it really is about that mental relationship that we have with money, whether you're the kind of person who needs that quick win to keep you encouraged versus sort of that, that bigger picture view. We do appreciate you breaking all this down for us. Lawrence Sprung, founder of Midland Financial and author of Financial Planning Made Personal. Thank you so much. All right, all your markets action is still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Are we going to continue to see a slump in stocks from here? I think we're going to continue to see some volatility. There's a lot of catalysts that are on the horizon from the CPI print, the trajectory of the Fed, um, looking at earnings and the health of the consumer. So while it may not be a slump, I think we'll see some choppy markets from here to the end of the year.
In July, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates for the 11th time since March of 2022. The Fed is expected to hold steady while watching inflation data, hoping for it to go down to 2%. But with oil prices increasing, hitting those inflation targets might be more difficult than predicted. To talk more about this is Yahoo Finance reporter Ines Ferrer. Ines, what are you watching? Well, Rochelle, next week we'll be getting the inflation print for August. Year-over-year year inflation is expected to jump to an annualized rate of 3.6% in August versus 3 3.2% in July. Meanwhile, economists forecast core inflation, which strips out food and energy costs. That will stay unchanged. Now, the Fed tends to watch core CPI, and that's been on a downward trend. But higher oil costs can still seep into the core. That's through higher diesel, higher gasoline costs, jet fuel prices, all derivatives of crude. Omar Sharif of Inflation Insights tells Yahoo Finance we may see higher restaurant prices and any goods that is moved by truck such as furniture and appliances. Even airfares could see a bump this week. United Airlines said that in July, since mid-July, jet fuel prices have climbed over 20%. Now, the Fed is expected to hold rates steady when it meets later this month. It's still watching that data to make sure that inflation continues to fall. And Wall Street analysts have walked back those the possibility of recession, prompting some speculation that the Fed could actually pull off a soft landing. But economists say if you throw in the mix the higher oil prices, that could pose a problem. There's nothing worse than higher oil prices. It will slow growth. It sucks purchasing power and it adds in to inflation expectations, Rochelle. And as you mentioned, they're really seeping into a bit of everything in terms of, you know, how we pay for airfare and put gas in our cars as well. So then what are oil market analysts saying about where prices will go from here? Well, let's take a look at where they're at right now because we are watching WTI crude that's at $87.61, Brent crude up above $90 per barrel. I'm gonna pull up a year-to-date chart because you can see here from the end of June into right now, we are seeing this that's up to about 25% for both WTI and for crude oil. So an increase of 25% in these prices. A lot of this has to do with the production cuts that have been announced by OPEC Plus, Saudi Arabia's unilateral production uh, cuts, and Saudi Arabia analysts are telling me they want oil prices to be above $80 per barrel, and they will do everything possible to maintain it that way. So I spoke to one analyst that said to me, look, between now and next summer, you can expect to see these prices elevated. The only thing that would bring down oil prices, though, is if we do see a recession. And certainly seeing that perhaps telegraphed, perhaps for 2024. So we'll have to wait and see. And as for I appreciate you breaking all that down for us. Thanks so much. All right. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. What is the thing that you most want to avoid in the market right now? I would say market timing. There's a lot of dynamics about um, either being all in, all out, and look at what's happened year to date. I don't think anyone was anticipating the rally that we've seen in U.S. equities. So this idea of just being balanced, staying invested, um, staying diversified, and not trying to time these markets.
Although drugs containing Ozempic or Wegovy have been in the news because of their effects on weight loss, the drugs were originally developed to help those suffering from type 2 diabetes. And a new study shows that those drugs could be able to help type 1 diabetics as well. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani to discuss this more. It seems we keep hearing about some of the additional benefits of some of these drugs. That's right, Rochelle. And just another one to add to the list. So a new retroactive study looked at a very small pool of patients who were newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. They were also skewing on the younger side uh, in their mid-20s and 30s. And what the, uh, what the study found was that these individuals needed to depend on insulin less with the use of semaglutide. That's the formula for Wagovi and Ozempic. So what they found was that uh, these, these individuals were able to eliminate altogether non-mealtime insulin within three months, and some of those patients reduced mealtime insulin use after seven months uh, of being on this. So what it basically means is that a larger clinical, you know, randomized, full-blown clinical trial is needed, but it does indicate yet another potential positive for the use of these drugs. And of course, we know Novo Nordisk, the maker of semaglutide drugs, is the has the lion's share of the market for these weight loss and diabetes products. If you take a look at their lineup, and includes, of course, Wagovi and Ozempic, individually uh, slated for weight loss or diabetes. They also have the pill that's slated for diabetes. And then an older uh, set of GLP-1 drugs, Sixenda and Victoza, one for weight loss and the other for diabetes. Now, the difference is that, of course, these newer drugs have had such a large impact on the actual weight loss percentage that patients see, and that's why they're so much more popular uh, than the older drugs. But we've seen similar uh, sort of studies in the past for additional benefits of even the liraglutide. And so now, with in addition to what we already know with potential improvements in uh, heart disease and, and prevention and more studies on the way for things like liver disease, these semaglutide products are really looking strong um, and really encourages that coverage conversation because we know, of course, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not they should be covered. And we do know that the U.S. currently uh, really is the largest market of these products for the company in the latest earnings report. They showed that, you know, the sales of these products, the semaglutide products alone accounted for five billion dollars in the first half of the year for Novo Nordisk, and that's already 50% of their sales for the year, year to date. And you, you're seeing on your screen just that increase, that insane increase in the sales in these markets. Meanwhile, we know that the company is hampered by supply. That continues to be the only problem to basically skyrocketing sales for them. At a recent event, the CEO uh, did say that uh, you know, they do expect that the supply is going to be the problem moving forward, saying, quote, I think for the foreseeable future, we'll have a situation where demand will be larger than what we can supply. So even with additional lines, they do still face a shortage right now. Certainly a good problem to have, especially if the, if the demand is out there, but we'll have to see how they manage those supply issues. Appreciate you getting us up to speed. Anjali Kimlani, thanks so much. Well, the whirlwind of generative AI information and innovation has torn its way through traditional practices recognized for decades. And much like the dot-com bubble, many, many are saying eyeing those drastic changes with positivity, choosing to see what benefits can be reaped from continued developments. But many are also stressing their concerns, particularly as AI remains relatively unregulated. We see that playing out in many ways, from the writer sag after strikes to students cheating on their exam papers or perhaps rising worries about how AI might impact people's civil rights in the workplace. Let's bring in Alexandra Givens, Center for Democracy Technology CEO and President. Thank you for joining us this morning here. So in terms of the key concerns that you're seeing in this space, obviously you have a lot of people racing into this space, building on it, while also still having their concerns. But a lot of these tech companies, at least, that voice the concerns are still the ones at the forefront of pushing it forward. That's absolutely right. And one of the most important things is that we are talking about the full range of concerns and that all of these things are on the table. There's a lot to be excited about when we think about the developments in medical research, how quickly human advancement is going to keep moving. There's a lot for us to champion, but we need to think about the ways in which AI is impacting people's lives already, right now, sometimes in deeply harmful ways, and make sure that we're planning with deep caution and accountability toward the future. 
So as we look at some of the risks, I mean, there's there's accuracy, reliability, some of the bias that can be built in, because obviously these models are only as good as the data that's being put into it, and it's being put in by human beings who come with their own set of biases. What are some of the concerns and how are you seeing those managed, perhaps any calls by regulators that you're seeing? Sure. So the accuracy concerns are real, right? We're seeing that there can be hallucinated results, that they sometimes can be tools that simply aren't fit for purpose. And one of the biggest things that I worry about is how to make sure that the public and consumers understand those limitations and that companies who are deploying these tools are taking that into account and not overhyping their potential and are being very real about the risks uh, and the lack of accuracy in some of the results that are generated. That's one set of concerns. Then we need to think about what happens even when the tools are working well, when they're not biased and they are actually producing accurate results. That can be dangerous too. So one big area that people are talking about is the risk of consumer fraud. How much easier it is going to be to create fake images, to target people with specific scam schemes using generative AI to make those much more accurate and personalized in a way that makes it easier for fraudsters to use those tools. And then, of course, as we talk about fake images, we have to worry a lot about the integrity of our information ecosystem, about the potential impact on elections, about people who might be the victim of extortion screams using manipulated images of them in compromising positions. All of these things sound like they might be conjecture, but they're real. We're starting to see them play out already, and we need to be reactive to those threats as well. And I mean, you raise a good point because we certainly saw that with the rise of deep fakes, this certainly would, t would take it to another level when you add in those extra layers of data. Um, what about companies themselves? Because you have a lot of people perhaps in the workplace figuring out how to use it in their everyday work. But obviously, if you're working for a, a company, you might be exposing some of the company secrets. What's being done around protection in that space and the conversations being had there? Yeah, we've seen exact stories along those lines too. You know, company employees revealing personal information or putting in a code that was still under development and using a co-pilot technique to use generative AI to build on that code, but in so doing, revealing, you know, company secrets. So this is why companies at both the developer stage, so those are the companies creating those tools, and the vast majority of the economy who are going to be deployers enterprise customers of these tools need to be making informed decisions. They need to be asking really hard questions around the privacy, around the data security protections, um, around what their employees are doing and how they make sure there are appropriate guardrails in place and ensure that that is part of the acquisition process and that that is how we think about um, accountability being distributed throughout the chain. Of course, legislation has a role to play in this as well, and there are really important conversations happening in Congress, in the executive branch in the US, in Europe, and in other governments around the world. But so much of this is moving so quickly that legislation might be all be slow to catch up. So companies have to be thinking defensively from the beginning, thinking responsibly, and anticipating those unintended consequences to make sure that they're guarding against them. And so then when we think of who should be leading the charge, I mean, we had that Reuters poll up showing that professions think, I guess, within their own profession, that they're best positioned to really understand and regulate the space versus governments. How should they be approaching regulation, regulating these spaces when there is specific knowledge uh, tied to specific professions which are going to need sort of specific oversight? There isn't sort of a one brush that would cover all. Yeah, it's a great point, right? So we're going to have to have different mechanisms to address the many different use cases of AI. How AI is used in the workforce, how it's used in hiring, is a very different set of considerations to some of the national security or cybersecurity threats that could emerge from AI. And so we need government to be nimble and to have the different, in, in Congress and the legislative bodies, the different committees of jurisdiction looking at their respective areas and different agencies uh, looking at that as well. So I think the answer really is going to be a combination of legislation and guardrails, in particular on some of the minimums, like what is the type of testing that companies are doing? What are the levels of transparency and reporting of that testing that we require for society to be able to actually understand how these tools work and hold them accountable in a business transaction as well as as the broader public? So there are some things that are cross-cutting that legislation can do, but then committees are going to have to look at those targeted interventions as well. For example, how a worker vindicates their rights when they're discriminated against by an AI hiring tool. That is a specific inquiry that we need to have, and we need to have legislation that can address that as well. So it's going to be an all of the above scenario, including, as I mentioned, this role for companies, uh, even when there is not legislation immediately eminent, leading in this way, making sure that they're earning their customers' trust and that they're developing these tools responsibly.
Certainly trust uh, an important commodity in this space when, as you mentioned there, some of this information we're not going to be, uh, be able to know at first what's real and what's not and looking for some of these caveats that the government is asking for that some of these companies could put on. But regulators, at least for now, appear on the back foot versus the progress that we're seeing in generative AI. Do appreciate you joining us this morning. Center for Democracy, Technology CEO and President Alexandra Givens. Thanks so much. Thanks. And make sure you tune in on Monday in the 10 a.m. hour when Yahoo Finance's Julie Hyman and Brad Smith will be joined by some leading experts in the AI space to talk about the impact on the workforce. You don't want to miss it. Well, regulation around crypto has been making headlines lately, with the SEC filing lawsuits against the several big names in the space, from Ripple Labs to FTX, and it's having significant impacts on crypto investments. It might be why some crypto exchanges start searching for more regulatory clarity around the globe. At least that's what Coinbase chairman and CEO Brian Armstrong told our executive editor Brian Sozzi at the Goldman Sachs Communicopia and Tech Conference. Take a listen. Well, I think stable coins are a really important stepping stone, you know, so in crypto writ large, it's, it's the most important technology out there to update the financial system, right? Um, we've seen that that 67% of Americans think that the financial system is in need of a major update. Crypto is the best opportunity to do that. So yes, we're going to have decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Uh, we're going to have things like Ethereum that are building new application platforms on top that are totally decentralized. But if we need to get people, you know, sometimes you have to meet people where they are, right? And so if they want to use US dollars for now, um, that's great. We have now U.S. dollars running on crypto rails that are more efficient, more global. They allow you to do cross-border transactions or send small amounts to people no matter what country they're in. So um, these things are all going to help the crypto, crypto ecosystem grow and um, get to that decentralized vision. I think you put out a tweet recently. I really liked it. You, you said bear markets are the best time for building. So what else are you building at Coinbase? Yeah. What should an investor expect to come up on the platform a year from now? Yeah, well, I don't want to pre-announce anything here, but I, a couple of big ones we've talked about recently. So we launched Base, which is our layer two solution that's helping blockchains scale. We need to get the, the costs down, the confirmation times down to be really competitive. And, you know, payments flow to the path of least resistance. The less friction you can make, the more, the more payments there will be. Uh, we've also been investing a lot in our derivatives platform. So, you know, I mentioned that internationally, both in, and then in the U.S. as well. So we're, we're, we'll keep pushing on a few of those. I also put out a blog post talking about some of like the future ideas on the horizon and we're, a number of um, you know our venture investments might go into things like that. But I talked about flat coins, which is kind of the next iteration of stable coins that's more maybe linked to CPI or purchasing power. I talked about flat coin. Yeah, flat coin is- Where like, is that? Is that just only now developing? I've never heard of flat coin. Yeah, it's a new thing on the horizon. Uh, there's a couple teams working on it. Uh, we're not building something in that realm yet, but we're interested in it. And you know, how could, decentralized reputation protocols work or, um, you know, in, in online games, uh, people now want to own their in-game items and like, you know, how could network states be governed and, you know, so th there's lots of cool ideas. I, I put out a blog post and tweet about that too. Where is Coinbase at in terms of trading volumes? Are you seeing that improve at all? Well, um, it's come down a bit, I would say, since obviously the 2021 highs and things like that, but we're not, un we're not like unused to these, these cycles, right? So, um, we see when prices go up, obviously more retail interest. What's interesting in this down market is that we've actually seen there's been a kind of a flight to quality. So we are seeing more institutions come in and sign up, go through our onboarding process. And they're not necessarily moving huge amounts of capital in yet, but they are, they are on, onboarding and waiting and seeing to say, okay, what's that trigger for them? Maybe it's, maybe it's the blockchain has become more scalable. Maybe some regulatory clarity, maybe a court case happens. And I think we'll start to see um, different amounts of capital actually come in at that point. When does regulation come? What does that even look like? Well, it's already happening in the world writ large. You know, I mentioned, you know, Europe, um, the UK, Australia, Canada, Brazil, um, these regions, UAE have all been actually very forward thinking. 83% of the G20 countries now have this crypto legislation either already in place or in progress. Um, it's really, so I don't know if you're asking just about the US, but in the US, I think it'll happen in the US. Yeah, it'll happen in one of a few ways. So one way is the courts. The courts can, can be the one to provide the clarity regardless of the outcome of the case. It, creating case law is a, is a way to get there if the regulators aren't gonna provide it. Um, another way to do it is through Congress, right? Congress is very engaged in this now passing, uh, it, it, looking at this FIT21 bill that's um, which just got bipartisan approval in the House. The stablecoin uh, market structure bill uh, also got bipartisan approval in the House. So we'll see how that makes its way through the Senate and uh, the executive branch. Um, the CFTC could step up and assert more authority. 
I also think, you know, there's a possibility we'll just get a different SEC chair in 2024 or, or beyond. So um, some, we'll try all these things in parallel. Somehow one of them will come through. Before I let you go, I don't think investors realize how much time you do spend talking to regulators and, and other politicians. What is that like? Uh, that, that, did you expect that when you founded Coinbase? Um, well, the role of a CEO is always evolving to what's the most important thing, right? So I started the company really as an engineer, just typing on my laptop um, and built the initial version of the app. And then, you know, as something grows, it starts to have a really important uh, role to play in society. And so, yeah, you start to engage with governments, um, world leaders, banks. And we're at that phase now where we need to make sure that we are an educational resource, that we actually bring the crypto community together to make sure our voice is heard. And there's these great websites like standwithcrypto.org, which are helping the crypto industry come together and say, hey, look, 56 roughly a million Americans have used crypto now. It's 5x as many as have electric vehicles, just as an example. And we're voters. We, we want to donate to candidates that are supporting crypto. We want to show up at town halls. I don't think everybody in D.C. actually fully realize how powerful, realizes how powerful the crypto voting block is. And I think 2024 is an election where you know, the voters of America are really going to hold candidates feet to the fire and say, what is your position on crypto? Are you going to be uh, a continuation of these existing policies that have been unnecessarily hostile? Or are you going to allow this technology to flourish and ensure America's leadership as a technology hub? Do you see certain folks out there in the political sphere as, as friendly? Any candidates that you say, wow, they get elected, my job might become, become a hell of a lot easier? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I don't want to come out and personally endorse anybody, but yes, if you look at the, the presidential candidates that are in the running today, they're talking about crypto. And so far, as far as I can tell, all of their comments have been positive. They see it as an opportunity to challenge um, the, the policies that the current administration has had in downstream effects with the regulators that they, they view as not in line with what the American people want. And so I think this could become a hot topic in the presidential race in 2024. A big thanks to our executive editor, Brian Sozzi there, and Coinbase CEO, Brian Armstrong, for bringing us that interview. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Have a wonderful weekend.